Control, ladies and gentlemen. Another October has rolled around, and with it, another World Series. Ready for play ball. What do you do, ladies and gentlemen? We're at Wrigley Field in Chicago this afternoon for the third game of the World Series. Here is the great moment. The Yankees have come on the field. And the 1936 World Series is history. The first game of this historic 1948 World Series gets underway. Live and in color, it's 1969 World Series Baseball. The first night game in the history of Good the World Series. baseball fans, this is Mel Allen. Hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Gowdy. Hi, everybody. I'm Vin Scully. Hey, and everybody, I'm Keith Jackson. And welcome to the World Series for 1981. For the first time in history, it will be played inside World Series where we fly the colors of two countries. Florida Marlins have made it to the World Series faster than any franchise in Major League history. It took 44 years, but the Subway Series is back. The first time since 1986 they get a chance to see their beloved Red Sox in a World Series. The St. Louis Cardinals are headed back to the World Series. It's no wonder then that this is our national pastime. Settle back and enjoy the ride. It's not easy to get there. It takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of guys contributing. Have a good day. Come on. Something good is going to happen to you. This is one thing I think you go to spring training for, to work hard, to, to go and play in the World Series. I think every player's dream or goal is, is to play and win a World Series. You realize that, and then there were two left standing, and you're one of the two. As a kid, I dreamed that someday I would be playing the World Series. You're no longer that child that's sitting in front of the television set and watching the World Series. This is the moment I've been dreaming about. And here you are. I say to myself, thank you. My dream come true. It's the ultimate level, really. The two best teams for that year from the American National League. Uh, and you're part of it. You're part of history. And the world is watching. You know, it's scary, electrifying, it's wonderful. And uh, it's just different. One of those things that's kind of an out-of-body experience. I never knew how I was going to react if that opportunity came where I knew I'd have a chance to, to go to the World Series. You don't think about it. All you do is think about uh, getting the guy out. You don't think about the fans. You don't think about what it means. You don't think about the TV cameras. Enjoy it. You may not get in another one, and I didn't. In life, it was one of the goals that I set out to achieve, and I lived it. I just felt really good that day, and I told the guys, I said, guys, don't worry about it today. You got to jump on my back. I'm going to carry you today. Bucket caught. We'll see you tomorrow night. If I was a Dodger fan, I would have been, ah, here comes Kurt. You know, I dreamed it up, and it happened. And why it happened, I can't tell you. The impossible has happened. The, the writers wanted to interview my glove and not me. Great play by Robinson. What a play. Colfax pitched the greatest game that I've ever seen pitched. Bob Gibson that day, he was untouchable, unbelievable. And we will never again see anyone come close to three complete game shutouts in a World Series. It won't be done. The one, two to Clemente. He swings the ball. Swing. What a player he was his whole career. And then to emphasize it with a World Series like he had was just fantastic. See ya! See ya! See ya! A home run by Derek Jeter! What he's been able to do has just been incredible. Derek Jeter's Mr. November! Reggie was always at his best when they turned the bright lights on. First pitch. Oh, what a blow! This is history. He's not called Mr. October for nothing. Being in the same company with Babe Ruhr and Reggie Jossom, it's unbelievable. Well, I was pretty nervous myself. It was quite a thrill. I'm glad it happened to me that day. Well, I wish I would have kept the ball. I gave him the ball. <laughs> and I can't tell who's going to come in. It is going to be Grover Cleveland Alexander. All people come on. The Gianfrido catch in 47 is frequently grouped with the Willie Mays catch in 54. I knew right away I was going to catch the ball. Hitting a home run in Chicago that time. The Lord was with me when I called the shots. I caught the whole Red Sox infield napping. Mazeroski has hit a 1-0 pitch over the left field fence to win the 1961. We beat him. We beat him. We beat the great Yankees. I know exactly where I was when Fisk hit that home run. If it stays fair, home run. 
I wonder if the foul pole didn't have that screen on the inside pole, what would have happened? I don't know. I was up on the railing and Brian Anderson was sitting next to me. Scotty hits the ball and he jumps up and just screams. Oh my God! And I just sitting there going, no way. No, no way. And then it went out. Matsui has his third home run in only 10 at bats in this World Series. Freeze leading it off. Freeze tied this game in the bottom of the ninth with a two run triple. Three ball, two strikeout. In the air to center. Has he done it? Way back. It is gone. Hello, game seven. People were crying, people were laughing, you know, people were hugging, and uh, people were screaming. I mean, it had every emotion possible. We will see you tomorrow night. Trying to survive. It was just sheer luck. Little roller up along first. It gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. We won the game on a ground ball. Touch him all, Joe. You'll never hit a bigger home. And I'm thinking, why did not I learn to do cartwheels? greatest feeling in the world. If you happen to win, it's magnified that much greater. You know, they've often said, if, you, if you're going to lose, you better lose early. Because if you lose in the World Series, that's what's remembered the most. To go to the World Series, I mean, we took it as far as we could go. Unfortunately, we came out on the short end. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. I can remember people saying, well, you know, you shouldn't feel so bad because at least you got there. Look at all the other teams that went home. Well, we didn't go there to lose because all of your dreams as a kid, you never lost. But if you don't win it, you know, I don't know what you feel. I don't know what the Red Sox felt. I don't think they were feeling too good. I, you, you've got to win it, you know. You know, planning is one thing, but, but you've got to take home that, that ring and that trophy. Winning, that's it. Knowing that you worked that hard for one reason, that's to win a championship and you're able to do it. A oh, World Series is a World Series no matter where you play. It's not another ball game. You just can't get any higher than that. Well, it was the fulfillment of a dream. Being able to run out on that mound when the last out is recorded and jump around and be world champions, it's the greatest feeling in the world. They're all little league kids again. This is the dream come true. They're going to own a ring that says World Series champion. You know, whenever you're at the pinnacle of what you do, the sport that you play, you can't describe it until you go there. The chills that I get them still when I watch them, the introduction, the national anthem, it's, I think, the purest form of championship in any sport. Major League Baseball Productions presents the World Series, History of the Fall Classic. Through the latter part of the 19th century, Major League Baseball was becoming established as the national pastime, but only with a national league. With the turn of the century, however, came the advent of a competing league. The American League grew out of a high minor league called the Western League or Western Association, which was run by a gentleman named Ben Johnson to compete with the monopolistic National League. Major cities in the East and Midwest were granted teams in the American League in 1901 and were soon able to coax some stars away from the National League, like Nap Lajue, the league's preeminent hitter, and Cy Young, 
the most accomplished pitcher of his era. The Sporting News strongly endorsed Johnson's new league, and fans flocked to the games. In just its second year, the American League outdrew its national counterpart by half a million fans. The league vaulted from a stepchild status into a full-blown league. Finally, in the American League's third season, the champions of the two leagues agreed to meet come October. It was, at first, simply a matter of challenge. The American League champions, Boston challenged Pittsburgh, the National League champions, and they agreed on a nine-game series. Ben Johnson gave the Boston team one injunction. You must beat them. And behind the pitching of Cy Young and Bill Deneen, who threw 69 of 71 innings between them, Boston did beat Hannes Wagner and the Pirates five games to three. There isn't much people remember today about the 1903 World Series, but what should be remembered is Boston defeated Pittsburgh, so it was the upstart American League beating the established National League. And in a lot of ways, that added credibility to the American League. So not only had the National League lost some of its best players to the American League, it had also lost the first official World Series. As such, there was a residue of bitterness, perhaps best exemplified by the owner of the New York Giants and their fiery manager, John McGraw. The next year, the National League champion, the New York Giants, McGraw's first pennant winner, had an owner who refused to accept the challenge from the upstart American League. This cancellation caused so much fuss that the same owner of the Giants, John Brush, then wrote up rules for how a World Series should be played, and those rules exist to this day. And so, in 1905, the World Series, as we now know it, finally got underway. In 1905, we saw really the first official World Series. It was the biggest sporting event in American history to that time. The two biggest cities in the country, Philadelphia and New York, the two most famous managers in baseball, Connie Mack of the Philadelphia Athletics, John McGraw of the Giants, and the two great pitchers, Matthewson and Gettysburg Eddie Plank, matched up in game one. Christy Matthewson was the first great superstar of the 20th century. Year in and year out, good pitching will win in the World Series. And really, that goes back to 1905. Matheson wins three shutouts, only one guy gets the third base. In fact, what Matthewson did in 1905 while leading the Giants to a four games to one victory may be the single greatest performance in World Series history. For in the course of six days, Christie threw three complete game shutouts, a feat that could never be equal today. The structure of the game no longer permits three consecutive complete game shutouts. Teams that get to the World Series will have it deep bullpens, they'll have outstanding closers, and we will never again see anyone come close to three complete game shutouts in a World Series. It won't be done. Still another feat many thought would never be duplicated took place in 1906, when the Chicago Cubs won a phenomenal 116 regular season games, a record unmatched for nearly a century. At that time, the Cubs were sort of what the New York Yankees represent today. They were perhaps the consistently best baseball team in the major leagues. The 1906 World Series was the first of three straight for the Cubs. It was also the first intra-city series, as the Crosstown White Sox upset the heavily favored Cubs four games to two. When the Cubs returned to the Fall Classic in 1907, they met Detroit and promptly became part of an historic series moment. Game one of the World Series in 1907 has that kind of romantic aura. The Cubs were down three to two in the bottom of the ninth, and then the Tiger catcher Charlie Schmidt dropped a third strike, which allowed a run to score, and the game was tied. It went on another three innings, was then called on account of darkness as was common in that era. Cubs went on to win the next four games and sweep the series. It was pretty dramatic in your opening game of the series to, uh, to have a 12-inning tie. Call it Cubs karma if you like, but it continued to follow Chicago into the 1908 season as the team maintained its winning ways 
and its reputation as the best franchise in the game. 1908 is the third year of what Cub fans would consider the best three-year period in the team's history, uh, three consecutive pennants, and you hear that team referred to as a Cubs dynasty. But they were in a nip and tuck, tremendous pennant race with McGraw's New York Giants. And that race took a turn on one bizarre play, one still known today as Merkel's boner. So what exactly was Fred's faux pas? His boner was that he did what everybody was doing at that time, two out, Game-winning hit, scoring a man from third. Merkel's on first base. He didn't go all the way down to touch second base. Evers calls for the ball, steps on second base. The umpire calls Merkel out, and you have pandemonium because you've got hundreds of people on the field at this point. Instead of a 2-1 giant victory, it was a 1-1 tie, which had to be replayed at the end of the season because the teams finished with identical records and the Cubs won the playoff game and went on to the World Series. The Cubs once again faced the Tigers in that 1908 series and won the first two games to stretch their series winning streak to six. They'd win the series four games to one, but was it thanks to Merkel's boner or his curse? People who really know their early baseball think that maybe if the Cubs hadn't sort of stolen that pennant, they might not be a, a cursed ball club today. It's kind of funny to think about, but when maybe you're not the team that's supposed to be there, that could cast a little shadow on your history. The Tigers got another shot in 1909, riding Ty Cobb's third straight batting title to their third straight series. The 1909 World Series was the Pittsburgh Pirates versus the, the Detroit Tigers, but it was more than that. It was a pitting of the two great players, one the stalwart, the veteran, and one the upstarts from Detroit. The thing that's so amazing is the personality differences between Ty Cobb on the one hand, this fiery, fiery, temperamental player, and Honus Wagner, this immigrant son. Big, lumbering, noble, generous. With two of the game's marquee players center stage, the World Series went to a deciding Game 7 for the first time. As it turned out, Wagner outplayed Cobb in almost every respect. Wagner was a hero. He was one of the reasons that the Pirates won the World Series. He batted over 300, sparkled in the field, stole six bases in the seven-game series. Wagner helped the Pirates atone for their 1903 series defeat. As for Cobb, the most dominant player of his era, he would never again play in a World Series. In just its second decade, the World Series had become an American tradition. In 1910, the confident Philadelphia A's won their third American League pennant and were matched up in the series against the perennial powerhouse Chicago Cubs. In 1910, the Chicago Cubs are the class of the baseball world. They're facing the new champions of the American League, Philadelphia Athletics. Athletics have a pitcher named Jack Combs. He wins three of the four games that Philadelphia wins. Coombs dominated on the mound, but the true genius behind the A's was their manager, Connie Mack, who cast a lasting image. He's standing on the dugout steps with a scorecard in his hand, moving his outfielders pitch by pitch and setting his infielders. What they now use with elaborate charts to show where every hit has gone, Connie had that all in his head. When the Athletics met the Giants in the 1911 World Series, they hadn't forgotten what happened six years prior. The A's uh, were smarting from their defeat in 1905 by the Giants, and the A's basically shut down the Giants' offense. Philadelphia captured its second straight series, thanks in part to the most valuable infield of the day. They have what is then called 
the $100,000 infield. $100,000 was supposed to be their value. The public imagination didn't go beyond the $100,000 in those days. They didn't yet think in millions. Before this series, A's third baseman Frank Baker had hit 11 home runs to lead the league. By the end of the series, he was officially known as Home Run Baker. McGraw had told the pitchers, whatever you do to Frank Baker, don't throw him anything up here. And McGuire in the second game of the series threw something up here and Baker hit it out of the park. Third game, Matheson's got it won. And bingo, he throws a high pitch to Baker and he hits it up into the polo grounds in the left field in that overhang. The polo grounds played host to still another World Series in 1912, which was also the first year of Boston's lucky new park. In the early days of Fenway Park, Fenway was kind of a good luck place, you know, which is amazing to think of now. But it opened in 1912 and the Red Sox had what might have been their greatest team ever. And the Red Sox also had some rather passionate fans. There were these guys in Boston called the Royal Rooters. You cannot describe these guys, the most rabid fans in the world. With fans like that behind them, how could Boston lose? Especially with their not-so-secret weapon. The Red Sox that year had a young, sensational pitcher named Smokey Joe Wood. Wood won 34 games that year and three more in the World Series to beat Christy Mathewson and earn a lucrative reward. Never forget the first check I ever got. We all got for 1912. $4,024.70 is our share, winner's share. In 1913, the Athletics again won the World Series, sending the Giants to their third straight series defeat. The A's pitching was really the story. They had two complete games by Eddie Plank and uh, two by Chief Bender, and uh, the Giants just couldn't do anything with these guys. The A's are just better. They are now the dominant team in baseball. They are what the Yankees later became, those A's of Connie Mack, at the baseball at that time. It seemed as if it would take a miracle to beat the powerful A's. And in 1914, Boston's National League team was more than happy to provide just that. The Boston Braves produce a miracle. They go from last place in July to winning the pennant handily over the Giants, and then sweep the A's in a four-game World Series. The improbable four-game sweep by the Miracle Braves brought a close to the reign of Connie Max A's. But Philadelphia remained in the picture. In 1915, future Hall of Famer Grover Cleveland Alexander won 31 games to lead the Philadelphia Phillies into the series against the Red Sox. Boston won in five games with a star-studded outfield of Tris Speaker, Harry Hooper, and Duffy Lewis. But the biggest name on hand was Woodrow Wilson, for this marked a turning point. The president at the, the World Series, which is the nation's showcase of our game, baseball, uh, that means a lot. Uh, having the nation's leader throw out the first pitch, attend the ball game, uh, really put a stamp on the game, meaning this was a national venue beyond just a sporting event. Wilbert Robinson's Brooklyn Robins were the National League team in 1916, and making the first of his many World Series appearances was Casey Stengel. The mighty Red Sox were seeking their third World Series title in five years, and about to make a name for himself was a young Boston pitcher named Babe Ruth. Sherry Smith went the distance for Brooklyn in game two, matching the rising young Boston star pitch for pitch, but Ruth prevailed two to one in a 14 inning masterpiece that began an amazing World Series scoreless inning streak. It's been said that uh, he was the best left-handed pitcher in the league at the time, and uh, he was extremely proud of his pitching record. Behind Ruth, Boston won its second straight five-game series. The National League entry in the 1917 World Series once again was John McGraw's Giants, this time facing the White Sox. This was a team of several shady characters. 
and we'll never know uh, what they were doing in 17, 18, 19. They were a very good, tough, and tough to be team when they wanted to be. The White Sox beat the Giants that year, but they stumbled in 1918 and finished sixth. In turn, the Red Sox earned their fourth series berth of the decade, though under unusual circumstances. The season was cut short by World War I. There was a worker fight order, which made the baseball season end abruptly on Labor Day. It wound up as a World Series between the Red Sox and the Cubs. In that series, Ruth extended his World Series scoreless inning streak to a record 29 and two-thirds, and Boston won for the fourth time in seven years. Red Sox fans never had it so good. If you're a baseball historian, it's no secret that the Red Sox were one of the dominant teams in the early years of the American League, certainly. And they won five of the first 15 World Series, which is pretty dominant, including three World Series in the teens when Babe Ruth was here. In 1919, the White Sox returned to the series and took on the Cincinnati Reds. The Reds had gone 96 and 44 that year, and that was eight more wins than Chicago. But most observers thought the Sox were a near lock to win the series. They went into that World Series very strong favorites. Although the odds started to change as the series approached, because word started to slip out that some of these players might not be trying their best, and indeed they weren't. First baseman Chick Gandel was the apparent ringleader of a plot to throw the series. As many as seven teammates were involved, the most important being Eddie Seacott and Lefty Williams, the team's two best pitchers. Gandel even managed to enlist one of the game's very best players in the scheme, the great shoeless Joe Jackson, although the extent of his involvement is still in dispute. When Seacott hit the first Reds batter of the series, it signaled that the fix was on. The performance of the Sox in losing game one was not very artful. The errors were blatant. This was an open secret among those who were in the know, players and writers. Many baseball writers in Chicago knew of the scandal, or at least suspected of the scandal that had occurred during the World Series. The Reds went on to win the series, and a year later, the owners chose Kennesaw Mountain Landis as the game's first commissioner. It would be his job to look into the fix and clean up baseball. Judge Landis issued his famous ruling that for any man who conspires or has guilty knowledge of a fixed ball game is gone. In the end, eight members of the team that would be known as the Black Sox were banned from baseball, including Shoeless Joe. The nadir, the worst moment of baseball has got to be the throwing of the series by the Black Stockings. because it embodies that priceless spirit of equality that is the very backbone of America itself. While the Black Sox scandal was a very dark chapter in baseball history, in 1920, the game was revived, and by a mere babe. Perhaps the perfect contrast to move attention away from the Black Sox and back on the field came this bigger-than-life player, Babe Ruth. What this converted pitcher did was hit home runs more than anyone before him, and his prowess captivated fans everywhere. So the whole era of baseball changed, and at the center of that was Babe Ruth, with that big bat, that explosive power, and that Ringling Brothers personality. And it came right at the edge of the White Sox scandal. It was the most fortuitous conjunction imaginable. But not even the powerful Ruth could do it alone. And in fact, he wasn't even part of the 1920 World Series. The American League was represented by the Cleveland Indians, a team that had persevered in the face of tragedy. 1920 was a very emotional season. Uh, near the end of the season, the Cleveland Indians shortstop Ray Chapman uh, passes away after an on-field accident. He was hit 
in the temple by a pitched ball, and he never recovered consciousness. The team rallied around this, and they had a great final month of the season. A late season call up filling in for H. Chapman, Joe Sewell, went on a tear and eventually a Hall of Fame career. He was joined by Tris Speaker, one of the greatest center fielders ever, who as player manager led the Indians to the first World Series in franchise history. The 1920 series drew a lot of attention and fan interest in the outcome of each game between Cleveland and the Brooklyn Robins was evident in the streets. I think the people of Cleveland were so happy with their first pennant and the, the people in Brooklyn were the people of Brooklyn. I don't think they ever entertained the slightest doubt that these were good men and true. And the series, of course, was played completely above board and it was a memorable series. In fact, the Indians won the championship five games to two. But even that took a back seat to some World Series firsts, like Elmer Smith's Grand Slam, and a very peculiar play that involved three Robins and a then unheralded Cleveland infielder. Bill Wamsgans is the quintessential being in the right place at the right time guy. While a decent infielder, uh, we would never have heard of him today if it weren't for the fact that in the 1920 World Series, he got a line drive stepped on second and tagged the runner coming from first to second to create the only unassisted triple play in World Series history. Everybody who has steps on the field has a chance in the blink of an eye to live forever. Being the guy who performed the unassisted triple play really bothered him because he's quoted as saying that it was like I was born the day before and died the day after. Babe Ruth continued his offensive onslaught in 1921 and welcomed some old teammates thanks to the Yankees' new GM. Ed Barrow had been the manager of the Boston Red Sox in 1918, the last year they had won the World Series. When he came to the Yankees, everybody remembers that he recruited Babe Ruth. But the fact is that within three years, nearly half the Yankee team were former Red Sox. Barrow had simply raided the team, bought it retail and wholesale, and moved it to New York. The new additions helped the Yankees win three consecutive pennants and square off in all three World Series against John McGraw's Giants. The Giants were still a power, but McGraw was losing New York to Ruth and the Yankees. The Yankees outdrew the Giants in the polo grounds, and this just drove McGraw crazy. Ruth was hurt for part of the 21 series, and the Giants took the title. But when a healthy Ruth returned in the 22 Classic, McGraw devised a scheme to neutralize the Bay. McGraw told his pitchers to just pitch him in the dirt, that he was going to be swinging at anything. There's no question that Ruth is the greatest fastball and curveball hitter in the business. He could not hit slow stuff. He just couldn't hit it. The plan worked perfectly. And McGraw's Giants won their third World Series title. Though now twice a bridesmaid in New York, the Yankees had become the darlings of the city's fans, and the Giants' skipper had had enough. McGraw couldn't stand the Yankee popularity. He didn't like Babe Ruth, and so they asked the Yankees to leave. And so they built Yankee Stadium, and they did so just a stone's throw, literally, across the river from the Polo Grounds. It was in Yankee Stadium that the 23 series opened, but it was the Giants who won the game. Ironically, thanks to the efforts of a future Yankee manager. In the very first game, with two outs in the ninth, Casey Stengel, who was an outfielder for the Giants, hit a ball between the outfielders. Stengel flew around the bases for a go-ahead inside the park home run, and he had another eventual game winner in game three. But the Yankees did come back, and they won four of the next five games. It was the Yankees' first ever World Series title, even further obscuring their crosstown rivals. What gets lost in there is the performance of the Giants. I mean, the Giants were equally as successful. The Giants, I believe, get lost in the shadows. In 1924, those Giants won their fourth straight pennant, but once again were overshadowed in the series, this time by an aging pitcher known as the Big Train. Walter Johnson was by then acknowledged as the greatest pitcher of all time, pitching year after year for losing teams, setting fantastic totals. He won over 400 games. He pitched over 100 shutouts. He was it, but he was now at the end of his career. It looked like Johnson might end his career without having had that distinction, but Washington assembled a really good team behind Johnson. 
The Senators won the American League pennant. Now they get into the World Series against McGraw's Giants. This team had seven Hall of Famers and managed by John McGraw, regarded by many as the greatest manager in the history of the game. The mainstay of a second division team for almost his entire career, Johnson now was a sentimental favorite in his quest for World Series glory. Johnson, the grizzled veteran, was quite the figure of sympathy. Everybody wanted the Senators to win so that Johnson could win. It wasn't that there was a national consensus behind the Senators because Washington was our nation's capital. It was because Johnson was a popular figure. Well, Johnson lost the first two games he pitched, and this was regarded as a national tragedy, that Walter Johnson was going to be regarded as the GOAT. But the Senators weren't about to let that happen to the big train. They evened the series at three games apiece. And in game seven, Bucky Harris caught a break. He hits a hard grounder down third base that presumably hits a pebble and bounces over Freddie Lindstrom's head for a double that scores the tying run. Walter Johnson, who had been beaten badly two days before with one day's rest, came in and held this powerful New York Giants lineup scoreless for four innings. And then in the 12th inning, the same thing happens. Another drive down to third base, it's by legend the same pebble <laughs> and goes for the game winning hit. And lo and behold, the Senators have won the World Series. Washington went crazy. And after waiting all those years, Walter Johnson had the most glorious of all victories. The line that got circulated so much was, God just couldn't stand to see the big train lose another one. Johnson led the Senators to another World Series in 1925. But though he won two games in that classic, the Pittsburgh Pirates won game seven for their second title. The Yankees returned to the series in 1926 to face the St. Louis Cardinals, led by perhaps the greatest right-handed hitter ever, player manager Rogers Hornsby. The team would be bolstered by the acquisition of a castaway pitcher, a future Hall of Famer, more than happy to join the winning team in St. Louis. About mid-season, the Cubs asked waivers on Grover Cleveland Alexander, who was alcoholic, epileptic, but one of the greatest pitchers who ever lived. He had been a great pitcher. He has the same number of wins lifetime as Christy Matthewson, 373. Hornsby, though he hit Alexander well himself, knew that few others did. He said, I want him. I don't care whether he drinks or not. Alexander had a renaissance in the Cardinals' rotation and won game two of the series. With St. Louis facing elimination, he got the call again for game six. In the sixth game, he pitched a complete game victory to even the series at three to three. Game seven is started by Jesse Haynes. The bottom of the seventh, the Yankees load the bases two out, and Haynes can go no further. Haynes uh, will be relieved, and I can't tell who's going to come in. Lester Bell, the third baseman of the Cardinals, said there were younger men in the bullpen, fresher arms. That it was only one man we wanted to see coming out of there. Let's see who it's going to be. It is going to be Grover Cleveland Alexander. All people, come on. Alexander came out and he told Hornsby how he's going to pitch to Lazari, hard hitting young second baseman who was at the plate. I'm going to pitch the first one, fastball inside, and then I'm going to curve him low and away. One, two, three. And Hornsby said, No, you can't do that. You can't throw him a fastball. He's a fastball hitter. And Alexander said, if I put it where I want to put it, he's going to hit it foul if he hits it at all. And then Hornsby said, well, who the hell am I to tell you how to pitch? Hornsby returned to his position, and Alexander followed his plan, including, of course, an inside fastball that Lazeri pulled foul and two outside curves that ensured his place in history. The pitch is one on it for strike three. All Pete comes in and strikes out, push him up Lazeri with the bases full. It's funny how many people think that was the end of the game, but it wasn't. The game ended oddly in the ninth. He gets down with two out, he gets the three and two on Babe Ruth. And he pitched him with such caution, he ended up walking him. And Ruth, for some reason, got it into his head to steal second base. The big guy takes off, tag is made, end of series, and for once, age triumphed over youth. It was the first title for St. Louis, and the final flash of glory for Alexander. 
Of all the many games and innings that Alexander worked, he's remembered mostly for one at bat. By now, Ruth had been a Yankee star for seven seasons. And though he continued to rewrite the record books, New York had won just one title. All that changed, however, in 1927, when the Yankees assembled a team for the ages. The 27 team is considered, you know, maybe the greatest baseball team of all time, and Ruth sits right in the middle of it. The Babe hit a record 60 home runs, defying all logic. When you have a guy who hits more home runs than most of the teams, well, that's a pretty special player. He was joined by first baseman Lou Gehrig, now entering his prime. Gehrig drove in 175 runs and won the MVP award. Gehrig had a fierce, combative spirit. When he went up there to hit, he had one purpose, to knock the hell out the ball. There were two great hitters, and it was a one-two punch. Ruth and Gehrig were complimented by Tony Lazeri, Earl Coombs, and Bob Musil. But in truth, they needed only one name. This rare assemblage of talent was called Murderer's Row. The 27 Yankees led the league in runs and home runs, but they were more than just offense. It was a great, great team. Plus, it was a team that had incredible depth on their pitching staff. The Yankee top pitchers had the top three earned run averages in the league that year. So how can, how can you beat that combination? Heading into the World Series, the Yankees had already achieved legendary status. And even though the Pittsburgh Pirates fielded five future Hall of Famers of their own, it was apparent from the start that this would be no contest. When the Pittsburgh Pirates were sitting in the stands and watching all the ball go out of the park, it was Gary and Ruth. <laughs> I think it, it beat them right there. Following their batting practice barrage, the men of Murderer's Row, led by the Big Two, swept the Pirates, offering further proof of what many still believe today. Despite all the enormously talented Yankee teams down through the years, I would still select that as the greatest New York Yankee team of all time, and perhaps the best baseball team of all time. Still, the offensive show put on by Ruth and Gehrig in the 1928 series remains the benchmark by which all others are measured. In 28, Ruth had three home runs, all in the final game. But Gehrig had four, four home runs, four games. The two of them together hit well over 500. It was a four-game sweep over the Cardinals. With two straight titles now, the Yankees seem poised to carry their domination into the next decade. Boys, is uh, Babe Ruth has already uh, stated that the Yankees of the pennant uh, already won. I think feel that it's up to you boys to show him that he's all wrong. And the Philadelphia A's would do just that as the once struggling franchise returned to greatness thanks to the visionary skill of owner-manager Connie Mack. Mack gradually has been piecing together what will be the greatest of all the A's teams that in 1929 overtakes the Yankees. The Athletics were loaded with stars who stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with even the greatest Yankees teams. They were solid all around. They had Mickey Cochran catching in left field. They had Al Simmons, Jimmy Fox on first base. He was the strongest man I ever saw in baseball, I mean, as a hitter. He had arms like a blacksmith. They called Jimmy Fox the right-handed Babe Ruth, and he won four home run titles during his career. But the A's also had the most dominant pitcher of the era in Lefty Grove. He could get you out. I think he threw 200 miles an hour. Looked like a pea coat up there. You see it, you would see it. The A's were the new class of the league and entered October filled with confidence. Maybe we'll all have more to say after we play the Cubs. Philly met Joe McCarthy's Cubs in the 29 series with Grove the obvious choice to start game one. But the crafty Mac had a different plan. Mac studied that 1929 Chicago lineup, which was powerful. Hornsby, Kyler, Stevenson, Wilson, but they were all right-handed hitters. Emke was an old KG right-hander who threw a lot of slow curves, and Mac guessed that Emke would keep them off balance. And he did, 
allowing just one run while striking out a then World Series record 13 batters. Later in the series, the offense took over. In the fourth game of what turns out to be a five-game series, they beat the Cubs with a dramatic 10-run seventh inning and also wins the last game with a ninth-inning rally to wrap it up. The A's would steamroll into the Fall Classic again the next year, bearing all the features of a dynasty. In 1930, they beat the St. Louis Cardinals in six games. Yes, sir. There goes Al Simmons with the four-bagger that gave a lot of St. Louis fans heart failure. In 1931, they win the pennant again, three in a row. They're acknowledged they are the class of the baseball world. The 31 series matched Philly and St. Louis once again, but this time the Cardinals had a little more seasoning. Pepper Martin was added to the team in 1931, coming off of the 1930 A's Cardinals World Series. He's the new guy on the team, but uh, he's incredible. He batted 500, he stole five bases, and really was the difference in the seven-game series. So the A's reign of glory was interrupted by a star who had arrived in the nick of time. Pepper Martin was exactly what the country needed in 1931. They needed a hero. We were in depression. It was an ugly time. It would also presage an ugly time for Connie Mack, forced to sell off many of his stars in the coming years, thus ending the A's dynasty. I was on the 1932 Yankees, the world's champions, and you can go back and check the records. The 1932 Yankees was better than the 1927 Yankees that everybody says is the greatest ball club. Go back and check the records. Well, both the 27 and 32 teams featured the one-two punch of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And though the spotlight still fell on the Babe, his career was winding down as he entered his 10th fall classic. I think I'm a pretty fortunate fella to get in my 10th World Series. I think that's going to be a record to stand for a long time. The 1932 Yankees were piloted by manager Joe McCarthy. And in the World Series, they faced the Chicago Cubs, a team McCarthy had led to the pennant in 1929, only to be fired a year later. So it's no surprise that there was animosity between the two teams. And it peaked in the fifth inning of Game 3, with the score tied at four. Was here a legendary tale was born as Ruth came to the plate. But I will say that I've had thrills before, something like uh, hitting a home run in Chicago that time. The Lord was with me when I called the shots. The called shot home run in game three of the 1932 World Series, the Yanks playing the Cubs, there's bad blood between the two teams. That resulted in a lot of bench jockeying, uh, primarily from the Cubs side, directed at Babe Ruth. Both clubs riding each other, doing everything to get each other's goat. Well, I had this one particular time when I went to bat, Charlie Root was pitching. And the first pitch ball was a call strike. Well, I thought it was outside and didn't like it very much. So the boys that were there would give me this, on you, on you. Yelling from the Cub dugout was positively sulfurous. He was taking a lot of ribbon from the bench. And they called him, you know, big fat guy and slob and stuff like that. Well, the second pitch ball was another call strike. Well, I didn't like that one either, so I let it go by. I stepped out of the box, and by that time, they were over there going crazy. This is the furor, and here's a guy standing still in the middle of a net bat doing all this. And then he makes his famous gesture. Well, I looked out at center field, and I tore it. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flagpole. He just holds up his hands. That, that's only two strikes. Well, the good Lord must have been with him. And it was only two strikes because the next one he hit out of sight. As he rounds the bases, he gestures again to the Cubs, pushing at them with both hands as to say, don't ever challenge me again like this, you know, because I'm Babe Ruth and I can do what I want. <laughs> and so he did. Did he do it? Well, you can add this home run to the long list of things these teams did not agree upon. 
Men on the field were later interviewed. The Yankee side of it followed the party line, said yes, of course, he was pointing out his home run. The Cub players just smiled and shook their heads and said nonsense. Fact or fable, the Yankees won game three, swept the series, and took their fourth world championship. Ruth wasn't in the 33 series, but cheered on Joe Cronin's Senators. Joe, got to keep up the American League's good work now. I know you're going to have a tough time with those giants, but they can be four strikes to suit. Thanks, babe. Hit right. hopefully him like you hit <laughs> In addition to Cronin, Washington's 26-year-old player manager, the Senators featured feared hitters like Goose Goslin and Buddy Myers, a consistent 300 hitter. But they'd have to master New York's pitching tandem of Hal Schumacher and the great left-hander Carl Hubble. The two had combined for 17 shutouts during the regular season. Still, the decidedly young Cronin was confident of the Senators' chances in the World Series. You know it's going to be a real hard fight, and we're going to try our best to knock them off. Bill Terry was the new player manager of the Giants, having succeeded the legendary John McGraw a year prior. And Terry also put on a positive, if not emotional, game face. The Giants are a great ball club. They won the, won the pennant of the National League, and I believe that we'll beat Washington in the series. Terry's confidence was vindicated when Hubble dominated game one. He had a screwball that uh, he'd start off with one that would drop in for a strike, and you'd say to yourself, well, I can hit that, let him throw it again, and then the next one would explode. And then first thing you know, he had two strikes on you, and then he'd throw you another explosive. And we try to hit him, but we take our hats off to Hubble's particular pitch. Throughout the series, the Giants pitching staff proved too much to overcome. But a good deal of credit also has to go to slugger Mel Ott, who hit 389 and showcased his all-round talents. I hope I don't overuse the word uh, respect and admiration, but... He was a great ball player. He had that unusual batting stance where he would raise his right leg and plant it down and get position to hit that ball. And it's a lot of power and a good clutch hitter. When Ott came up with the score tied at three in the 10th inning of game five, New York was looking to close out the series. That's the smack by Mel Ott into the stands that knocked the Senators out of the series in the 10th inning of the final session. Four out of five games for the Giants. Hats off to the world's champ. In 1934, one brash team stood out. And here they are, the St. Louis Giant Killers, last-minute winners of the National League pennant. Now, I don't say we were the best club in 1934, but we thought we were the best. We were 25 that went together. And if anybody on the other club said anything about anybody, he had to lick all 25. That's the kind of a club we had. Hey, are those, are those Cardinals cocky here today? Here's uh, Rip Collins, Pep Martin, Jack Ruthrock. And are they playing some frisky ball? Frisky was one of the nicer things said about Frankie Frisch and the 34 Cardinals, called the Gas House Gang because of their rough and tumble style of play. The cards were led by the Dean brothers, pitchers Dizzy and Paul, who won 49 games between them that year. They'd face Mickey Cochran's Tigers in the 34 series. The Tigers featured their own solid ace in Schoolboy Row. Schoolboy Row meets the Dean brothers. Hello, Schoolboy. How are you? Just fine, Dizzy. How are you? Just fine, thanks. How are you, Paul? Fine. How are you, Schoolboy? Just fine. Blackie boy's got me in the middle. <laughs> But it was Dizzy who came out on top in the opener, going the distance and leading the Gas House Gang to an 8-3 victory. The irrepressible Dean continued to make his mark on the series in Game 4, but to the dismay of manager Frisch, he did so not with his arm, but with his head. Spud Davis got a base hit, and we're looking around for a pinch runner, and Diz just run right off the bench, and he went to first base. I said, Frisch must be crazy. His star pitcher running with all those guys sitting on the bench. And Frisch said, who the hell sent him over there? I said, not me. I thought you did. Well, the next hitter up hit a ball to Charlie Ganger, the double play ball. The wind up, and he cracked one, hopped down to Gehringer, takes it across to Rogel. And Billy Rogel came across second base, got the ball from Charlie, 
to throw the double play ball, thinking that the runner, you know, who did you think think it's going to slide. All I know is Rogel hit him right there. When you should go down, Diz one up. I didn't know I hit him. I never saw him. I still get letters. People think I hit him on purpose. And to tell you the truth, I never saw him when I hit him. The ball bounced up in the air, you know, and Dizzy went down like he was shot. Dizzy Dean, who'd gone in to run, going into second. Rogel took the toss from Geringer. Then Fine turned into a double play, threw hard to first. It hit Dizzy Dean on the head and is lying now motionless. They rushed him to the hospital and everything. And of course, you know, the newspapers came out the next day that Dizzy's head was x-rayed and they found nothing. <laughs> that was always a punchline that ended up the story. But Dizzy did make a quick recovery, and the legend of Dizzy Dean grew only larger. Hard-nosed Hall of Famer Joe Ducky Medwick also had an impact on that series. Going into Game 7, Medwick had 10 hits and needed two to tie Pepper Martin's 1931 series mark. Yo, uh... You're within two of a World Series record. Do you think you'll break it today as far as hits are concerned? Well, Pep, I'll be trying my best. I, I only hope I can live up to that record that you did. So it's rather the series that you had, and I'm sure I will break it. Atta boy. With Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis in attendance, Game 7 got underway, and Medwick and the Cardinals ran roughshod over Detroit, building a commanding lead. Then in the sixth inning, Medwick slammed a triple. And even though the game was well out of reach and the throw had not yet reached third, Ducky slid hard into the bag. And then all hell broke loose. Joe had tripled and he slid into third base. And Joe had a way of sliding with his right leg was underneath him and his left leg was up about knee high. And he caught Marvin on the shirt here. and. Uh... I guess Marvin thought he was trying to cut him. And it was not intentional. It's the only way he knew how to slide. And uh, he didn't try to cut Owens or anything. And with that, when Marvin took the ball and started after him. And he took a punch at Joe, and that was his first mistake. It's a good thing they stopped him, because Medwood would have probably injured Owen for life. And the war was on. The next battlefield turned out to be left field. But when Medwick took his position, the artillery came raining down. And then when Medwick took his place out in the field at the end of the inning, why you know, the fans out there were so discouraged and upset by that time. They'd all come out to the game early expecting the Tigers to win the seventh game. And they all brought their lunch with them and they started to throw it at Medwick in the field. They threw everything, bottles, and it was really a dangerous situation. So dangerous, in fact, that a decision had to be made by Commissioner Landis. The information, Judge Landis has ordered that Medwick be taken out of the game for a safety. All of the players are gathered up around the judge's box now. Judge Landis is talking to both Marvin Owen and Joe Medwick. He said to Frisch and Medwick, the best thing is for Joe to leave the game. And that was the best thing, and, and Medwick went. And so, one hit shy of tying the World Series record, Ducky was done. It was a, a bad display on the part of the baseball fans of Detroit, but I I can understand it. I felt if I'd have had something to throw at him, I'd have probably thrown it too. I was so upset. The Cardinals then wrapped up this emotional World Series behind the headstrong Dizzy Dean. Here's the pitch. A fast down to second with the road to take. Boss is the first for the final out of the 1934 World Series. The St. Louis Cardinals win this seventh and the batting game a shutout for the great Dizzy Dean. That was a big disappointment because we had a better team than the Cardinals and we never got the recognition for it because they were A, won the World Series and B, they had a very colorful club. They were a good ball team, but I thought we were better. As it happened, the Tigers got a chance to prove how good a team they were in the very next World Series. And they went charging into that 1935 battle with an elite group of ball players. The G-Men. Tigers had Greenberg, Geringer, and Goslin, and they were known as Detroit's G-Men. This was quite a threesome. Detroit would face the Chicago Cubs, and in Game 2, the Tigers suffered a severe blow when Hank Greenberg, the American League MVP, suffered a broken wrist while sliding into home plate. We're going to miss it. 
but we showed we could win without him. Indeed, for in the ninth inning of game six, Goose Goslin had a premonition about his 129th and final World Series at bat. Goose Goslin and I were sitting on the dugout steps in the last inning when we were all tied up with the Cubs, and Goose was the fourth hitter. And he turned around to me and he said, I have a feeling. He said, I have a feeling I'm going to be at bat with a winning run on base. And he said, if I am, he said, we're going to be the world champions. Goslin batting at the last half of the ninth inning. The ball game tied up three and three. Here's the pitch and a drive going out to right field for a hit. And here comes the throw to the plate. Here comes the run in. And the ball game is over. And the Detroit Tigers are the new champions of the world. When he came in after that hit, I ran out on the field and Goose came toward me and we threw our arms around each other. And all he said, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? What did I tell you? And that was a, a moment that I'll never forget. But the fans went absolutely wild. In Detroit that night, they literally upset streetcars. Detroit could not contain itself. The Tigers had given the city its first ever World Series championship. So when you talk about Detroit, just say the city of champs, because we really were. In the mid-1930s, a truly powerful team brought a winning tradition back to New York. The 36 to 39 crew doesn't get much attention. Yet it could be argued that this was the greatest of all Yankee contingents. Ruth was gone after the 34 season. It was now Lou Gehrig's team, but only for a nanosecond because Joe DiMaggio came in in 36 and instantly made an impact. You added DiMaggio to that mix. I mean, just think of DiMaggio and Gehrig in the same lineup. This team couldn't lose. It began in 1936 against their crosstown rivals, the New York Giants, as the Yankees embarked on still another run of greatness. Bill, you made a remark to me yesterday in the Yankee Stadium when you were playing in, Louis, or in Toledo and I was playing in Louisville. Little did we think that we were going to be here and uh, represent the New York clubs in the World Series. You're right, Matt. And I'll say one thing for you. You've done a great job as manager, and you've got a great ball club. But we are going to give you a battle, and may the best club win. Thanks, Bill, very much. Thank okay. There's only one question before this or any other house. is what will Lou Gehrig do against Carl Hubble? Is the pitch mightier than the bat? Well, in 36, the bats of Gehrig and the rest of the Yankees prevail, as the Bombers captured the crown four games to two. With a blossoming DiMaggio in the mix, the Yankees beat the Giants in a World Series rematch and then swept the Cubs in 38. Three straight and counting for Jolton Joe. 1939 was probably in some ways Joe DiMaggio's best season. It was a year when he really dominated a winning team and a league in a way very few people ever have. DiMaggio would have to pick it up in 39, for this was the Yankees' first postseason since 1923 without Lou Gehrig. The Iron Horse had been diagnosed earlier in the year with the illness that now bears his name. And all he could do was watch as the Yankees went after an unprecedented fourth straight title against a very good Cincinnati team. Cincinnati was a wonderful ball club in 39. They had Hall of Famer. Ernie Lombardi was their great hitter. They had a very strong lineup. They had very good pitching. So they seemed to be a serious threat to this Yankee dominance. And of course, by now, after three World Series in a row, something that no other team in the history of baseball had ever done. It could be argued that this 1939 team was the most dominating team of the century. And in the World Series, they certainly proved it. DiMaggio and the Yankees beat up on the vaunted Reds pitching staff, winning the first three games. Then in game four, Charlie Keller and DiMaggio combined to create still another chapter in Yankees lore with the help of Reds catcher Ernie Lombardi. It all began with the Yankee Clipper. I believe I got a base hit to right field. Headlocked at four all, but in the Yankee 10th, Walters pitching again as DiMaggio, a single to right. Corsetti scores. Keller rounding third, lights out for home. And the ball had gone over Ival Goodman's back somehow or other. Things happened in the World Series. 
and Goodman had thrown the ball home. And Lombardi was waiting for him, and Keller hit him. Instead of sliding, he went in standing up, and he hit Lombardi in the side of the head accidentally. And uh, knocked him down in beside the plate, and the ball went out of Lombardi's hand. While Lombardi was sort of sitting at the plate with a ball a little ways off his feet, DiMaggio came in. The time was I was getting so close to the plate, he had wakened, and he grabbed the ball and put it right on top of home plate, and I was fortunate enough to put my foot right over the ball and tag the plate on the other side. And the feeling was that DiMaggio scored because Lombardi was not alert and aware enough to get the ball. And it was nicknamed by the media, which always does the labeling, the great snooze. Four straight World Series victories for the Yankees as they took their rightful place in big league history. The Yankees of 36 through 39, not only did they win the World Series each year, but they annihilated the opposition. They just rolled over. Four pennants, four world championships. They were a juggernaut. And now for the season's classic, the World Series, where champion meets champion for the highest honors in baseball. And in 1940, that honor once again went to the Cincinnati Reds, who returned this time to face the Detroit Tigers. The Reds showed no ill effects from their loss in 39, and even when trailing three games to two, went back to Cincinnati confident, with Bucky Walters and Paul Derringer set to start games six and seven. We felt as a team that uh, with our pitching, and particularly anchored by Walters and Derringer, that we would beat you. Walters dominated Detroit in game six with a five-hit shutout. And Derringer beat Bobo Newsom in the finale to bring the title back to Cincinnati after 21 years. The greatest thrill that I had out of baseball was winning the World Series in 1940 for Cincinnati. The people in Cincinnati so supported that ball club that you just wanted to do something for them. The 1941 World Series pitted the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Yankees, a rivalry that was to become famous but was not yet famous. The first ever meeting between the two teams featured three straight, tightly contested games, each decided by a run. The Dodgers lost two of the three, but led game four by four to three, heading into the ninth. And it looks like the Dodgers are gonna wrap the ball game up. They got you, Casey, who's almost unhittable, and he's facing Tommy Hendrick, and he has to get him out to end the ball game. Casey's got me three and two, two men out. And catcher Mickey Owen called for Casey's best pitch. And I gave the curveball sign, and they rolled off that big with it, and this one broke. It went, Choo! It turns out to be the sharpest breaking curveball that Hugh Casey has ever thrown. So as I'm going through, I'm trying to hold the ball bat up too late. But at the same time, I'm looking behind me, and there goes the ball. There are two strikes on Henry. The ball got past Mickey, and it didn't really surprise me. I mean, we were both fooled. Owens' pass ball gave the Yankees new life, and they proceeded to take full advantage. Joe DiMaggio singles to left. Charlie Keller rips one deep to right field. It's going to be up against the right field wall. It's going to be in that for extra bases. Scoring, Henrik, and in comes Joe DiMaggio as the Yankees take the lead 5-4. Of course, the Yankees rally and win the game and then win the series the next day, four to one. So that one play, Tommy Hendricks' strikeout against you, Casey, became one of those memorable World Series events. And it was the most emotional loss of a World Series ever. Hey! 
The Yankees now seemed unstoppable and in 1942 coasted into the World Series once again in search of their sixth championship in seven years. The Bombers were a perfect 8-0 in the series since 1927, a record unmatched by any other team. Now they faced a St. Louis squad that had finished the season an amazing 43-8 to pass the Dodgers and capture the National League pennant. The Cardinals were a team of young, aggressive, hustling players. Stan Musial, Lena Slaughter, a great pitcher by the name of Howard Paulette, Marty Marion, the great fielding shortstop, and got into the World Series against the Yankees. They were the best. The Yankees, for years and years and years, back in those days, the Yankees were baseball. And I think the feeling was that the Yankees were going to really give them a lesson and show them, you know, what baseball was all about. And this is another Yankee sweep, and uh, the Cardinals will be finished. Even though the Yankees probably had better talent than we did in that particular year, uh, we knew, knew they could not beat us because uh, we were very confident. But after losing the first game, the Cardinals were put to the test in game two, having seen a three to nothing lead disappear late. Bonina Slaughter came up huge in the bottom of the eighth, scoring the go-ahead run, and then gunning down Tuck Stainback to thwart a Yankees rally in the ninth. Enos was noted for that play because it did uh, turn the series around. The momentum swing helped the Cardinals win the next three games to beat the mighty Yankees in five. They dominated the Yankees, and all of a sudden, uh, when everybody looked up, the Cardinals had won this surprising World Series. But these were different times, and winning the World Series was not the only thing on Enos Slaughter's mind. Well, you know, beating the Yankees in the 42 World Series, that had to be a great thrill, but it was a sad one. I'd already enlisted in the Air Force, and when after the series played, I went in the Air Force for three years. By the end of the 1942 series, the United States was fully engaged in World War II. And like most young men at the time, Major League Baseball players answered the call to military duty. Well, some of the very greatest players went abroad. Lord knows how many games Bob Feller would have won if he hadn't spent all those years on shipboard. Hank Greenberg was one of the first, uh, one of the greatest stars of his time and one of the first to volunteer and go overseas. Ted Williams, of course, served in that war. But there was enough talent to, uh, to keep the game going. And so, too, did the World Series go on. The 43 Classic was, in fact, a rematch of 42. Minus, of course, some of the big stars. Rizzuto was gone, DiMaggio was gone, but the Cardinals uh, seemed not to lose as many players. Uh, Musial was still around, so that the Cardinals were a strong team, but maybe not as strong again as the Yankees were. Just like the year before, momentum swung in a snap as the Yankees scored five times in the eighth in game three to come back to win. And eventually, they took the series four games to one. No doubt the revenge factor played a part. The extra incentive, having lost in 42, wanting to come back emotionally and prove their dominance, and I think they certainly did. The 1944 series was the third straight for the Cardinals, and largely due to thinned out wartime rosters, they'd faced their intra-city rivals, the St. Louis Browns, a perennial second division team. The St. Louis Browns got to the World Series in 1944, I and mean, that just, it took a global conflict to bring that about. In St. Louis, a large part of the sentiment was with the long shot. It was amazing that the Browns had so many brand new fans around. I could, they were rooting, rooting for the Browns. I guess they're rooting for the underdogs. But nothing could help the Browns at the plate where they hit a paltry 183, losing to the Cardinals in six. And he struck him out. It's all over. And all the Cardinals come tearing out of the dugout. And the Cardinals take the World Series of 1944, four games to two. By 1945, some of the enlisted players had returned to their respective teams. Greenberg, for example, returned to the Tiger lineup in July of 45. Oh, you're talking about one of the greatest, an icon in baseball. When Hank came back, he, he just buoyed the spirits of all. 
Greenberg rejoined the team in midseason and led the Tigers to the 45 World Series where they faced the Cubs. His two home runs and seven RBIs helped Detroit win in seven games. Johnson swings on one, slaps it down to Skeeter Webb, tosses underhand to Mayo. And I grasped that ball, realizing at that time I was a member of the world championship baseball team. A dream come true. By 46, the Stars had returned, and the Cardinals battled hard to return to the World Series. The Cardinals, who had dominated in 42, 43, 44, were back in 46, but so were the Dodgers. On the final day of the season, the two finished in a dead heat. So it was a playoff for the pennant. The Cardinals won it. And their World Series opponents were the Boston Red Sox, making their first fall classic appearance since the days of Babe Ruth. To me, that was a real, real good, interesting World Series. I mean, and there was a case of their power against our pitching and speed. The centerpiece of Boston's powerful lineup was the great Ted Williams, but the splendid splinter had little luck in his only World Series appearance. We were pretty fortunate that we did hold Ted down uh, in his hitting, but he hit some balls awful hard. I was playing second base, and I was playing practically in the first base position when he hit. I can remember him hitting balls at me almost turned me over. People say Williams didn't hit anything. That's where averages are, are uh, really misleading because Williams hit some shots in that uh, series. Meanwhile, a good deal of the credit for the Cardinals' success in the series must go to Harry Brakeen. The left-hander threw complete game victories in games two and six, and that set up game seven. There, Enos Slaughter showcased his aggressive style in one of the most memorable plays in series history, the Mad Dash. Well, Eno was the type of player that hustled all the time. He'd give every ounce of his energy to win a ball game. But a great play requires more than just a great player. It needs a special moment. Well, you know, in the first game, I tripled. Mike Gonzalez, our coach, stopped me third on a bad relay, and we lost the ball game. So Eddie Dyer, the manager, he says, from now on, with two men out, and you think you've got a chance to score, you go ahead and gamble, and I'll be responsible. And that's what was in my mind on this play. It was the last game that day, the seventh game, and in the bottom of the eighth inning with Slaughter on base and two outs. Well, the count was two balls and one strike, and he was stealing on the play when I hit the ball in left center field. I saw this little ball, it won't hit too hard, looped into left center. When I hit second, I says I can score. Enos kept running and took everybody by surprise because uh, we all thought that Gonzalez had his hands up to stop him. I never saw Mike Gonzalez, the third base coach, whether he tried to stop me, and I don't know. I never looked up. Enos kept running, and uh, that was a winning run. It was a great play. The Cardinals won their third title in five years, and life was good for a baseball fan in St. Louis. But casting a daunting shadow over the Redbirds and every other team in baseball were the New York Yankees, back in the World Series in 47, facing the Brooklyn Dodgers and their Rookie of the Year, Jackie Robinson. Robinson was a man on a mission. And he was really going to get into that series and show the Yankees how he could play. Jackie's presence and his aggressive play, especially on the bases, helped make the 47 series a classic. Every game seemed to be filled with incredible drama. There was almost the first no-hitter in the World Series, Bill Bevins. And with two out in the ninth inning, it's broken up by a pinch hit by Cookie Lavagetto, and Brooklyn wins the game miraculously. Seeing a near no-hitter in the World Series was about as rare as any sign of emotion from Joe DiMaggio. But that's what fans got to see when he just missed a dramatic home run late in game six. And DiMaggio got up. And DiMaggio hitting the ball. Gianfrido caught the ball, bounced into a little iron fence outside the bullpen. When Gianfrido came down with the catch and leaned against the bullpen gate, exposing the ball for all to see, DiMaggio uncharacteristically kicked at the dirt around second. Although Joe D and the Yankees lost that game six, they won the series the next day. Their 11th in franchise history. Following this all-New York series, there was almost an all-Boston series in 48. But Cleveland beat the Red Sox in a one-game playoff, thanks to player manager Lou Boudreaux's two home runs. 
He was coming off a great year, and Boudreaux was an inspirational type, and he was a, a fine leader. Behind Boudreaux and two victories from Cleveland ace Bob Lemon, the Indians topped the Boston Braves duo of Johnny Sane and Warren Spahn to win the World Series four games to two. And the 1948 World Series is all over and bring to an end another year of our great national game. was the capital of baseball, particularly in the 40s, and I think most particularly in the 50s. Imagine a world in which everything in New York City comes to a complete and utter halt when the World Series happens between two New York teams. Like the song says, it was New York, New York when it came to Major League Baseball between 1949 and 1956. A New York team won every World Series during those eight years and six of them were Subway Series. New York with three teams, they created this wonderful atmosphere and there was hardly a day in the summertime that one of those teams was not at home. And so many huge stars played in this golden New York era. Mays, Robinson, Snyder, DiMaggio, Berra, and Mantle, just to name a few. Of course, you always thought that the Yankees won the World Series. They were supposed to do that every year and they, they managed just about. So connected were the Yankees to the Fall Classic that when the Bombers finished third in 1948, they fired manager Bucky Harris and hired Casey Stengel to get them back to the postseason. And he did just that right away in 1949 when for the third time, the Yankees faced Brooklyn in the series. In game one, the teams were scoreless to the bottom of the ninth, and that's when Tommy Henrik came to bat. Tommy Henrik was... Uh quite a ball player. They call him old reliable. Newcomb had it. He hadn't walked a man all day long. He said it was a curveball. He didn't have a good curveball. And as I hit it and I went out to right field, I'm going down there. I don't know whether it's in or not, but I can see Carl Ferrillo's eyes go. I says, that's all. It's in the seats. The Yankees were back. The team's first ever World Series game ending home run set the tone and the Yankees won their 12th world championship four games to one. They accomplished the feat despite the fact that Joe DiMaggio had played just 76 games that year and the Yankee Clipper had a subpar World Series. I think I got two base hits out of the 18 times at bat. One was a little dribble of the third base and one I hit as hard as I could and just got to the bleachers out in left field for a home run. And not only did the Yankee fans cheer for me, but also the Dodger fans. That's how revered Joe D was in New York. But there weren't too many cheers from Yankees opponents in the American League, as 1949 began a streak of five straight pennants for the Bombers. In 1950, they faced a team making its first World Series appearance since 1915, a scrappy bunch of young Philadelphia Phillies who were known as the Whiz Kids. There's a gentleman, a writer, who came up with that name. We were young. There were about uh, 14 of us that were 23 and younger on that ball club. So uh, he just came up with this name, Whiz Kids, and uh, it was something that people always associate with that club. One of the youngest teams ever to appear in the World Series, the Phillies fought the good fight against the favored Yankees. And even though the Yanks did sweep the series, it was a lot closer than it may have seemed. Well, the Yankees didn't exactly uh, clobber us in that World Series. The first game was 1-0, and the second one was 2-1, and the third game was 3-2. And in the fourth game, I believe it was 5-2, and that took away quite a bit of the uh, pleasure of, of having won a National League pennant. The Whiz Kids tumbled to fifth place in 1951, and the New York Giants advanced to the World Series for the first time since 1937 thanks to the shot heard round the world 
Bobby Thompson's unforgettable home run. The Giants seemed to be a team of destiny, but they still had to beat the Yankees, whose heart and soul Joe DiMaggio was playing in his final fall classic. The Yankees beat the Giants and won Joe D his last ring, but the series was bittersweet because of what happened to promising 19-year-old rookie Mickey Mantle in game two. It was a ball hit between Joe and Mickey, and it was an easy fly ball that either of them could catch. And the next thing I knew that uh, Mickey was on the ground. I had to beckon to the bench to come out to the field to administer some first aid. And he wound up finally awakening, but he awakened with a burst of tears. And asked, I kept asking him, he's all right, but that's all he did was just cry through the pain that he might have had. It was an injury that would haunt Mantle throughout his Hall of Fame career. But in 1952, it was Mickey who led the Yankees into the series against Brooklyn. Mantle hit 345 in the Classic and helped the Yanks take a 4-2 lead into the bottom of the seventh of the seventh game at Ebbets Field. And that's when the Yankees' defense took over. They brought Bob Cazave in to pitch to me with the bases loaded and one out. I popped up to the infield. And then Jackie came up and he hit a pop fly to the first base side of pitcher's mound. The sun was going down, and it was a little hard to see from where Joe Collins, the first baseman, was playing. Joe Collins is nowhere near this baseball. The second baseman, Billy Martin, running from deep second base. That's a high pop-up. Who's going to get it? Here comes Billy Martin digging hard, and he makes the catch at the last second. It's identified as one of the great clutch defensive plays in the history of World Series baseball the biggest play of the series. It saves the game in the world championship for the Yankees as Kazava holds that 4-2 margin to the end. There was always a, a fatalism about it. The Dodgers were going to lose, the Yankees were going to win. This, this is the way the scripture had been penned. The eyes of the baseball world are fastened on New York, where it's the golden anniversary of the World Series. And a rematch. Unfortunately for the Dodgers, Billy Martin was still with the Yankees, only this time he did most of his damage with his bat. I remember Billy Martin that we didn't even take up in a meeting and he ended up getting more hits than anybody in the World Series. Martin up in the bottom half of the ninth and Martin laced one right up the middle, his 12th hit of the series making him the hero of heroes. Bomber scored and the Yanks won the game and the series. Yes sir, the Bombers did it again. Five World Series in a row for Casey Stengel and his American League whiz -bangs. They made baseball history. What a team. It took a record-breaking year to unseat these New York Yankees. And that's just what the Cleveland Indians had in 1954, winning an American League record 111 games while losing only 43. New York was still represented in the series, though, by the Giants, led by Willie Mays, their breakout star. The Say Hey Kid was as great in the field as he was at the plate, and in the eighth inning of game one at the Polo Grounds, he showed why. It's a tie ball game, and Larry's on second base and I'm on first. I knew that if a ball hit up the mill, there's no way I could throw Larry Dobert out at second, so I was playing very shadow. Wurtz hits this ball that looks like it's going to fall in there for three bases anyhow. There's a long drive, way back in center field, way back, back, it is. Oh, Willie Mays, Willie Mays, just brought this ground to his feet with a catch, which must have been an optical illusion to a lot of people. What made that play was his great throw. The runner's tagging in the second. That distance... If he, he misses him on the cutoff, he'll score. But he was right on. On the way in, I said to him, I said, I didn't think he was going to get to that one. He said, you kidding? He said, I had it all the way. <laughs> I said, you did, huh? You can tell that to, tell that to somebody else. <laughs> Willie's nearly unbelievable catch sparked the Giants, and they swept the heavily favored Indians to claim the world championship. For many New Yorkers, the baseball universe was finally righted in 1955 when the Yankees and Dodgers once again met in the Classic with Brooklyn now 0-5 against the Yankees. Forget everybody else. The Yankees are the only people to play. 
They're the only ones that were beating us, for heaven's sake. We played good games against them. We didn't play bad ball games. In game one, the Dodgers trailed 6-4 in the eighth. And on third base was Jackie Robinson. Not content to wait for a hit to drive him in, the daring Robinson bolted for home and in a signature play slid in under Yogi Berra's tag. Stealing home is, you know, probably the toughest thing in baseball to do. Yogi and I said no, he was out. I know I had him. I, I wouldn't argue that much if I didn't think I had him. And uh, he was just playing out, <laughs> that's all I can tell you. I talked to Jackie about the call. He said he thought he was probably out, but uh, he was called safe, so that's all we go by. Either way, it wasn't enough as Brooklyn lost both games one and two. Still, the Dodgers hung in, and the series reached a dramatic Game 7 at Yankee Stadium, Brooklyn needing just that one more win for their first ever world championship. But the Dodgers' seventh game starter caught many off guard. I was coming off a year that was 9-10, and 10, and if, I, if the Yankees beat me, they were supposed to beat me. Padre that day had good control. We finally got two men on in that one inning there when I come up. Yogi hit a line drive, sort of a line drive, down the left field line. I knew where Sandy Amoros was, and I probably should have moved him a little bit more with a left-handed pitcher. But when the ball was hit, I did not think that Sandy would get to it. And I said, oh, my God, here it goes again. The only guy that could catch Yogi's ball would be a left-handed fielding outfielder, and Sandy could run. And he made one hell of a catch, and there went the Yankees. The amazing grab by Amoros preserved the Dodgers' lead and brought all of Brooklyn to a frenzy. Now, if only Padres could hold on. It's a tense struggle into the last of the night. Johnny Padres pitching brilliant ball. One out to go. Elston Howard grounds to short. Reese throws to Hodges. Brooklyn wins, and the Dodgers go wild as they mob pitcher Padres, who hurls Brooklyn to its first World's Championship. We had a ticker tape parade all the way back to the Brooklyn Bridge. We went across the Brooklyn Bridge, and once we got into Brooklyn, people were just all over the street. I can remember the victory party in the hotel in Brooklyn, and thousands of people lining the streets behind their wooden sawhorses. People banging pots on the fire escape, car horns, church bells ringing. It was like the liberation of Paris, VJ Day, New Year's Eve, all rolled into one. So, Brooklyn finally had its first title, and Johnny Padres was named the first ever recipient of the official World Series MVP award. Just a year later, the two teams were back at it again in the Fall Classic, and with the series tied at two games apiece, another surprise starter, a guy who had started their game two loss, took the mound for the Yankees. Moose and I got to the ballpark early. Frankie Crossetti, the third base coach, was there. I went up to Frankie and I said, who's pitching today? He said, Larson. I said, oh, God, Larson. I knew I'd be in the bullpen, but I didn't think I'd start. And the way you knew you was pitching, there'd be a brand new ball in your shoe. So he got this locker and looked down there, and there was that ball, and he gave it a big gulp, you know. <laughs> that day, he, he threw everything over the plate. Anything I called for, he, he got it over. He never shook me off once the whole game. With two strikes on him, Jackie bounces the ball to the box and Larson tosses him out. I think I was the only guy that, that took the count three and two on him. Seventh inning, he came into the dugout, Larson did, and he sat next to Mickey. And he said to Mickey, he says, wouldn't it be something if I had pitched a no-hitter? Mickey says, shut the hell up, get away from me. It's a great superstition among ballplayers not to mention it. I just didn't use the word no-hitter. And I save that for my climactic moment at the end. Larson is ready, gets the sign. Two strikes, ball one, here comes the pitch. Strike three! A no-hitter of perfect game for Joe Larson. Yogi Berra runs out there, he leaps the Larson, and he's swarmed by his teammates. It's a great thrill. Uh, heck, this game's been played over 100-something years. There's never been a no-hitter in the World Series. And he pitched the perfect one. The Dodgers were able to force a Game 7, but the Yankees proved too overpowering as the Bombers, behind Yogi Berra's two home runs, shut out the Dodgers at Ebbets Field and were crowned champions of New York and of baseball.
That was a bleak day in Brooklyn, but it was not as bleak as the days that were coming because all of a sudden after 57, there were no more New York Giants and there were no more Brooklyn Dodgers. It was the end of an historic era in baseball history. True, the Yankees winning tradition endured and New York fans, many of them, continued to bask in their glory. But it was never again the same as the days when the Giants, Dodgers, and Yankees were all the toast of the town. of the baseball world are focused on the old familiar setting of Yankee Stadium. By 1957, it had become clear that rooting for the Yankees was a bit like rooting for U.S. Steel. The Yanks had monopolized the World Series, winning six of the previous eight. The Fall Classic had become a franchise trademark, and the Yankees knew it. It was almost a given that the Yankees were going to be in a World Series every year. It didn't seem like a World Series was a World Series without the Yankees. I was really lucky. I played with, uh, with the greatest teams in the world. We'd talk about it. We'd go to sign my contract. Even the general manager would say that when you're signing your contract. He would always say, well, now you know you'll get a World Series share. So while reaching the World Series in 1957 was nothing new for the Bronx Bombers, the Milwaukee Braves were charting new territory after Hank Aaron had clinched the pennant with a home run. The nucleus of that club was very young. We had never been through anything like a pennant chase before. And I felt like we were ready to go ride into the sunset and play whoever we needed to play, and that was the Yankees. But not all of his teammates shared Aaron's cavalier attitude, for these were the Yankees, and this was the World Series. For most of us, it was the first time to be in a World Series. And of course, going up against the Yankees, was even more mysterious. But the Braves had Lou Burdett on the mound. He won game two and then pitched a complete game shutout in game five. When the series reached the climactic seventh game, Lou kicked back thinking he'd watch his teammate Warren Spahn bring it home. I was scheduled to pitch the seventh game of that series and I came up with Asian flu and I was a sick son of a gun. So with Spawn bedridden, the Braves turned to Burdett, looking for his third series victory, but on a short turnaround. Can Burdett win again after only two days rest? All he did with the Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra lineup of the Yankees was shut them out. Matthews makes a miraculous backhanded stab of the ball, and the Milwaukee Braves are the new world champions. We finally got to be the champions over the Yankees, which I consider the greatest feat whenever we beat the Yankees. Burdett is the man of the hour. No one pitcher ever before has beaten the Yankees three times in a World Series. Everybody jumped on me. You felt strong enough to hold them up, too. <laughs> it was, it's a great feeling. The defending champs returned to the series in 1958, and they again took on the Yankees. Having been through the pressure of a series, the Braves were confident that they could repeat. 58 was a great year for us and we actually had a better team than we did in 57. We jump off through good pitching and pretty good hitting to a three games to one lead. The Braves are only one game away from a second consecutive world championship. But to some, the Braves' confidence had begun to resemble cockiness, as their two-star pitchers supposedly made some comments that the Yankees couldn't help but overhear. Warren Spahn and Luberdead popped off and they says they wish the Yankees were in a national because we wouldn't come in fifth place. Whether those fighting words did it or not, the Yankees came storming back in the series. Bob Turley got things started with a shutout in game five. And then Turley came on to save game six. When the game seven starter, Don Larson, faltered, Turley was called upon once again. And much as Luberdet had done to his Yankees the year before, Turley shut the Braves down, and the Yankees completed the phenomenal comeback. Turley finishes a superlative job to play a part in each of these three Yankee victories in a row. But the Yankees didn't get a chance to repeat in 1959. As the go-go White Sox finally broke through to win the American League pennant, it was just the second time in the past 11 years that the Yankees didn't represent the American League. 
the White Sox had fought many years through the 50s, came in second, came in third. The Yankees were always there ahead of us, it seemed like. It's World Series time, but what a change of scenery for baseball's greatest drama. A change because the White Sox would face the Dodgers, who, though no strangers to the fall classic, were now representing the city of Los Angeles. And after each team won a game in Chicago, a World Series contest took place in California for the very first time. The scene shifts to Los Angeles, where much maligned Memorial Coliseum, called everything but a baseball park, is the center of attraction. As a kid, I used to go to the 4th of July to see fireworks in the Coliseum in Los Angeles, never dreaming that there'd be a World Series played there. The largest World Series crowd ever fills the huge Los Angeles Coliseum for the first World Series game ever played on the West Coast. All three games, we had 92,000 people in a football stadium, really. These massive crowds watched their Dodgers win two of three, then head back to Chicago, where they would eliminate the White Sox in game six. It was a big thrill to uh, win a World's Championship, the first World's Championship in Los Angeles. In 1960, the Yankees returned to the series from their one-year break. There, they met the Pirates, who'd been on a 33-year series hiatus. After that long await, Pittsburgh was one big party. But although the city was on fire, the Pirates tried to keep their cool, knowing they were facing no ordinary team. The Yankees were the world champions for years and years. We were definitely underdogs because we hadn't won anything for 30 years. The 1960 World Series, in my mind, really is one of the most historic because it was a feast and famine World Series. The Yankees would win by double digits. And the Yankees win it 10 to nothing. And then the next day, the Pirates would squeak out a win and the Pirates win three to two. The Yankees seemed to dominate them, but they couldn't put them away. In fact, the Yankees had outscored Pittsburgh 46 to 17 through the first six games. But somehow, the Pirates had extended it to a deciding game seven. There, in the top of the sixth, the Yankees took a 5-4 lead on Yogi Berra's home run, and then appeared to put the game out of reach with two more runs in the top of the eighth. But up by three in the bottom half of the eighth inning, the Yankees got a somewhat dubious lesson in home field advantage. I don't know who had the worst infield, Pittsburgh or St. Louis, but it was like playing on a rock pile. The ground ball of Tony Kubek, a double play, would have ended the inning. Swing the ground ball, hit right toward the shortstop. Oh, it hits the back of the face. It hit him in the face, and Kubek has been hurt, and all hands are safe. A bad, hot ground ball came up and hit him in the face. Groundskeeper at Forbes Field can't even rake the damn field, so the ball hits a pebble. A pebble? What is a pebble doing on the field in the middle of a major league ballpark? Bad luck then turned to bad baseball when Jim Coates failed to cover first on Roberto Clemente's grounder. Now the Pirates trailed by just one, and catcher Hal Smith made the Bombers pay with a three-run homer. Incredibly, Pittsburgh now took a two-run lead into the ninth. My idea was just to go back out on the field and get three outs and we're world champions. But it wouldn't be that easy. The Yankees got two in the top of the ninth, and the game was tied at nine. We finally get the third out, and I'm back in the dugout, and I'm sitting in the dugout, and I'm just wondering how in the world we're going to beat these Yankees. And then somebody yelled at me, hey, Maz, you're up. will lead off in the last of the ninth. Going into that last inning, I was already thinking about the tenth inning, who was batting for us. I never thought about Bill Mazeroski. through my mind is we beat him, we beat him. We beat the great Yankees. Has hit a one nothing pitch over the left field fence at Ford Field. The Pittsburgh Pirates, the 1960 World Champions, defeat the New York Yankees, the Pirates 10, and the Yankees 9. With the bitter taste of the 1960 series still lingering, the 1961 Yankees made a powerful push to return to the Fall Classic. Led by Roger Maris's 61 home runs, the Bombers, as a team, hit a record 240 
regular season blasts, and they won 109 games to earn their shot at redemption. I think if you took that team and played the all-star team in either league that year, they'd have had a heck of a time trying to beat us. That was truly one of the greatest teams of all time. There was no team that was going to beat the 61 Yankees. That just wasn't going to happen. Of course, that's what they also said in 1960. And it's possible that the Cincinnati Reds used the Pirates as inspiration. But the Yankees quickly showed that this was a different year. Oh, I remember I was just a very young guy at that time. And I know that the big bad Yankees came in and kicked our tails four games to one. The Yankees didn't just dominate with their power. Whitey Ford pitched his third straight World Series shutout in game one and was less than three innings short of Babe Ruth's record of 29 and two-thirds consecutive scoreless World Series innings. But before Ford took the mound for game four, he got a history lesson. I had no idea that Babe Ruth had ever pitched. Before the game uh, in Cincinnati, the fourth game, the writers said, well, you're going for the record today, and I had no idea what they were talking about. Now Ford is only one out away from a new record of consecutive World Series scoreless innings. Chacon grounds to Richardson, who throws him out, and that makes 30 straight scoreless innings. Whitey Ford, the little lefty with a big heart, has shattered one of Babe Ruth's most cherished records. People were applauding, and I said, people won't usually applaud me in Cincinnati. Before leaving the game in the sixth inning with an injury, Ford extended his streak to 32 innings, and the Yankees won the title the next day in Cincinnati. Ford's streak would eventually end at 33 and two-thirds the next year as the Yankees returned to the series, this time to face Willie Mays and the Giants, who had to win a three-game playoff against the Dodgers to reach the Fall Classic. We had just came from L.A. where we won two out of three in a playoff. We come back into San Francisco having to play the next day. We land in San Francisco at 3 in the morning. We go home about 4 in the morning. Have to be in the ballpark at 9 in the morning. Mickey Mantle and Elston Howard of the Yankees seem confident. It's kind of funny the way you feel when you play the Yankees. I remember when I saw that team took the field, I said, wow. But if the Giants were intimidated by the pinstripes or exhausted by the playoff with the Dodgers, they never showed it. Back and forth, the two teams went, neither able to win two in a row through the first six games. Then, in the deciding seventh game, the Yankees had a 1-0 lead going to the bottom of the ninth. On the mound for New York was Ralph Terry, the guy who'd given up Bill Mazeroski's dramatic game-winning blast two years prior. And now... Mighty Willie Mays bats in the last of the ninth. Two out, Matty Alou on first. He hits the ball right down the first baseline, and Matty Alou running, and he could fly. And here I am standing at third base, and I think, oh, God, this game's tied. Fast fielding by Roger Maris prevents Alou from scoring the tying run. Roger Maris made a tremendous getting over there, cutting the ball off, a good relay. And then I threw it home. I got rid of the ball quick, and I threw it. It was on line. As it turned out, it bounced high, and so the runner possibly could have slid in there. The only way that you could have got Matty Alou, Roger would have to throw that ball all the way home and probably in the air. He had to stop. There's always been an argument. Could he have made it? He'd have never made it. So the Giants have runners at second and third with two outs. Willie McCovey, the batter. You got McCovey coming up. Now you got men on second, third, and two outs. That's when my knees start shaking. Understandably, because McCovey was one of the most feared sluggers in the game, but first base was open. Ralph Howard goes out to the mound to talk with Ralph Terry, and I thought they were discussing as to whether or not he wanted to walk me. I had had a real good series against Terry. So Ralph Howard says, look, we got first base open. They want to walk him. Ralph Terry said, no, I want to pitch to McCovey. Here's the pitch to Willie. Here's a liner straight to Richardson. The ball game is over and the World Series is over. Willie McCovey hit it like a bullet. When he hit the ball to Bobby, everything stopped. First of all, he said, oh, we're getting beat. We're getting beat. Oh, he caught it. The Yankees win one to nothing on a brilliant clutch effort by Ralph Terry, the hero of the 20th World Championship won by the New York Yankees. 1963 marked the eighth time the Yankees and Dodgers would meet in the series. It was also the 26th time Yankee Stadium would host the Fall Classic. As a baseball player, it was like no other stadium. The stands were so high, it was like being you know, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Whitey Ford and Sandy Koufax 
two of baseball's greatest southpaws will be the opposing pitchers in the opening game. It was pretty exciting to go into New York, pitch the first game of the World Series. This was something we were all looking forward to, Whitey Ford against Sandy Koufax. The best against the best. And you kind of thought the Yankees would prevail because that was their history. But Sandy Koufax took it to another level that day. Koufax begins the Yankee half of the inning by fanning two backs with a curveball. Bobby Richardson is next, and he strikes out on a whistling fastball. Tom Tresh takes a strike and is called out. As a lifelong Yankee fan, I still stand in awe of Sandy Koufax. Mantle faces Koufax in the second inning and is called out on strike. And now Roger Maris steps up to try his luck. Maris swings and fans for Sandy's fifth straight strikeout. On that day, the best pitch I've ever seen. Absolutely the best stuff that I'd ever seen in the game of baseball. Wright swings and misses for strikeout number 15. And the Dodgers have a big 5-2 victory. After Koufax had set the tone of the series, the Dodgers pitching continued to shut the Yankees lineup down. There wasn't much action in the Los Angeles bullpen as the Dodgers held the Yanks to just one run total in games two and three. The outcome of the series seemed a mere formality as L.A. sent its ace to the mound for game four. The Dodgers win two to one and sweep the series in four straight. To go and beat the Yankees four in a row, that was the greatest feeling of them all. Never before in all their wonderful years have the Yankees lost four in a row in a World Series. Of course, that didn't stop them from trying, returning in 64 for the 18th time in 24 years. Although the Yankees were older and slower, they were still the preeminent team in the American League. This was their fifth consecutive pennant, and even though they'd lost to the Los Angeles Dodgers the year before, it was still playing against the New York Yankees, and you've got to understand how important that was. It's a World Series for St. Louis. And everyone converges on Bush Stadium. It was our first World Series for the Cardinals since 1946. You can imagine how excited the fans were in St. Louis, how excited our ball club was. And I can remember more than anything else the awesome presence of Mickey Mantle. By 1964, Mickey Mantle was already a baseball legend. But in the bottom of the ninth of game three, with both the game and the series tied at one, Mantle's status as a mythical baseball figure grew even more as he came to the plate against knuckleballing reliever Barney Schultz. In the dugout, Mickey Mantle was standing there. He was leading off in the ninth, and he said, I'm going to hit Barney Schultz right out of here. Hit it forever. I mean, forever. Hit it to New Jersey. Mantle has just broken a World Series record. Riding the wave, the Yankees jumped out to an early 3-0 lead in Game 4. But then, in the top of the sixth, with the bases loaded, the Cardinals' Kenny Boyer stepped to the plate, with his brother Cleet looking on from third base. Boyer smashes it deep to left field. It might be out of here. It is a home run. A grand slam. Truthfully, I was probably as happy as him. I can imagine how my mother felt. Ken Boyer's grand slam propelled St. Louis to victory. And now it was time for the Cardinals to turn loose their biggest weapon. In that series, they had a guy named Bob Gibson. <laughs> he was nasty. Gibson threw all 10 innings in a game five St. Louis victory. After the Yankees evened the series, Gibson got the call again to pitch game seven in St. Louis on two days rest. All he did was throw another complete game and lead the Cardinals to the top of the baseball world. The Cardinals are the new world champions. Gibson, Boyer, and McCarver join in a big bear hug. Amidst the jubilation on the field in St. Louis, few could have guessed the secondary significance of this, the final game of the 1964 World Series. When the Cardinals beat the Yankees in 64, the Yanks were a damaged team, a damaged franchise. The last drop of greatness they had went into getting into the World Series. And 65 began the years of really being in the wilderness.
The team that did return in 65 was the Dodgers, behind the most dynamic pitching duo in the game. The big guys, Sandy and Don, were the keys. Koufax and Drysdale. They were both great pitchers and probably the two greatest pitchers in the game at that time. But the American League pennant winning Minnesota Twins had a few stars of their own. They had some good pitchers and some guys, you know, pretty good hitters. Kel Brew and Oliva and Allison and they had a good ball club. Koufax, everyone assumed, would start game one. Koufax was supposed to start the first game and it was a Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur. So Drysdale started the first game and we, we beat Don. And the second game, Sandy pitched and we beat Sandy. Our two Hall of Fame pitchers get beat. Twins have batted around. We're going home thinking, what happened here? We're 0-2. The Dodgers couldn't believe their misfortune. When we got back to LA and our home, we were devastated. We thought, gosh, we might have a chance to sweep the series. We lost three straight in the Dodger Stadium. I don't know if we would have beat them by Christmas out there. They kind of did a number on us. Back in Minnesota, the Twins won game six to set up a classic game seven. But Minnesota would once again have to beat Koufax. With just two days rest, I thought Sandy Koufax pitched the, the greatest uh, game that I've ever seen pitched and shut us out two to nothing. He did it. Sandy Koufax, his second consecutive shutout of the Twins. Sandy was dynamite, as usual. With Koufax pitching, we didn't have to score a lot of runs. One would have been sufficient enough. And the Dodgers have won the 1965 World Series. Well, the 66 World Series, I think we came into Los Angeles as the underdog. The, the Dodgers had beat the Twins the year before, and they'd been in three out of the last four World Series. We go into the World Series, they said we didn't belong with the Dodgers on the same field with the Dodgers. Triple Crown winner Frank Robinson was just part of the Orioles package. We had a pretty good team with myself and Aparicio and Davey Johnson and Boog Powell. We had Paul Blair in center field, and you just don't get any better than that. Drysdale again started game one and got hit hard early. Before I got my shirt off after warming Drysdale up, the two Robinsons, Brooks and Frank, had hit home runs against us in the first inning. Reliever Mo Drabowski won game one, and with Jim Palmer and Wally Bunker to follow, the Orioles now had a small edge. But young Palmer knew he had quite a challenge facing Koufax. Didn't take a rocket scientist to see when you're pitching against Sandy Koufax that you definitely had a great chance of losing. But as it turned out, I pitched my first shutout ever. And that started a trend. The last three games were all shutouts. I think six nothing, uh, one nothing, one nothing. They was just knocking us out of the box. Overpowered us, really. Before we knew it, it was over. Baltimore wins one nothing, sweeping the series in four straight over the night. In many respects, the 66 series was the best pitched since Matheson did it virtually all by himself in 1905. The Dodgers probably, I think, had the worst team batting average in World Series history, and the, for a winning team, we had the worst batting average for a team in World Series history. Pretty close to it, but despite the fact that Baltimore did hit just 200 in the series, the trophy was still theirs. We beat the Dodgers four straight. Hollywood would put something like that together. They say it would be too far-fetched. Seeking to write a Hollywood ending of their own in 1967, the Boston Red Sox were improbable winners of the American League pennant. We're going to go up against a seasoned uh, Cardinal team. Brock, Flood, Shannon, McCarver, Cepeda, Maris. And then if Gibson is pitching, you can see why they played as well and won as many games as they did. In game one of the series, the Red Sox faced Bob Gibson and lost. So Boston's best hitter took some post-game time to tune up. After game one, I was kind of wandering out into the into Fenway Park. And who is out there taking extra hitting after the first game of the World Series with Carl Yastrzemski? And sure enough, the next day, Yastrzemski second home run of the day. Still, the 1967 Triple Crown winner took a back seat to Jim Lonborg. The 22-game winner took a perfect game into the seventh and eventually evened the series at a game apiece. We go out to St. Louis. They beat us the next two games. Then I beat them in the fifth game uh, to bring it back to Boston again. They hadn't even packed their bags to make the trip back to Boston. We were surprised because we thought we were going to beat them in five games. Uh, we went 
all the way to seven games. And back in Boston, the Cardinals got some inspiration from the Boston papers. It had the headlines of those big three or four inch block letters. It said, Longborg and Champagne. <laughs> uh, I said to myself, and I think our ball club said, there's no way. It just won't happen. It probably wasn't a good idea to give Bob Gibson any extra incentive. I remember we were going to the ballpark, and he said, this is my game. I won this game. He was determined, and there was nothing more fearsome than a determined Bob Gibson. I felt sorry for the Boston hitters, in a, in a sense. He was one guy that, when all is said and done, I don't ever care if I face again as long as I live, and I won't. Not even in one of these old fantasy camps. Gibson allowed just three hits, and it was the Cardinals who drank the champagne. Gibson did it. Bob did it. He won three games, and he did it. End of story. Yes. The following year, Bob Gibson was still the story. 1968 was a, a very special uh, uh, season for the baseball purist. It was the year of the pitcher. In 68, for some reason, just happens to be the year that everything came together. And uh, yeah, I was in a zone. His microscopic 1.12 ERA set a live ball era record. In game one of the 68 series, had left the Tigers stunned. K-Line told me, no way, nobody could have hit Gibson that day. He was certainly a dominating pitcher, and that first game he pitched was, uh, was overwhelming. That particular day, I don't care what team they played, he was on master them. I mean, he, he, he couldn't do anything wrong. Got him! When I went up to try to bunt off of him, I swear to you, I never saw the ball. He got him! Struck him out! A new world record of 17 strikeouts in one game. It's surprising that Bob only struck out 17 with the type of stuff he had. The Cardinals won two of the next three to take a 3-1 lead in the series. But then, things started to fall apart. You got a team down, you got to put them away. We had the Tigers three games of one. We had an opportunity to put them away, and we allowed them to get off the deck. Lou Brock was one of the great base stealers of all time and an outstanding World Series performer. So it was ironic that a base running gaffe by Lou would start to turn the tide. The throw by Horton, and he is... Save. Oh, no. Brock doesn't slide. And that was simply the turning point of the series. At that point in time, the Tigers began to believe. The Tigers won two straight to set up a Game 7 showdown between Gibson and Mickey Lolich, each of whom had won twice. They kept the game scoreless into the seventh. But that's when the Cardinals slipped up. Flood hadn't fallen and tripped in the center field and that triple by Northup, they might still be playing. The Tigers won 4-1 to one and celebrated their first World Series title since 1945. 1969, man performed two feats that staggered the imagination of the American public. One took place when man first landed on the moon. The other took place in October. That's right, because in their first seven seasons, the New York Mets had never finished above ninth place in their 10-team league. But come 1969, they proved to be simply... Amazing. 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 Asombrosos. Amazing. 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 It's just amazing. We knew we had the pitching staff because the other ball clubs weren't uh, scoring any runs. But in the 69 series, these upstart Mets would have to beat a Baltimore team that had won 109 games. That's probably the best team I played on, and uh, uh, we just kind of blew everyone away. When Don Buford slammed Tom Seaver's second pitch for a home run, the Mets appeared to be in trouble. When he stepped on second base, Buford said, you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, he meant if I can hit a home run, you, you got Frank and Brooks and Boo Power and all these people coming up, that it's going to be a very, very short series. He was right. It's going to be a short World Series, but it's going to be on the other side. After losing game one, the Mets showed what made them so amazing. What kept us in the, in the World Series was our defensive plays. A.G. made tremendous plays in center field. A.G. Swoboda made a tremendous catch in right field. And I can remember at the time saying, 
<laughs> Boy, you just made one hell of a catch here. And this is a World Series. Agee's two catches plus Swoboda's, they helped define our team in the World Series, pitching and defense. They made all the plays. There was a lot of crazy little things that happened in that World Series. When you get in the spotlight and you're the only game in town, you never know what's going to happen. And sometimes the best really doesn't win. I said, we were a better team than they were. How can you say that? We were the world champions. We had to be a better ball club. We beat them four to one. The Mets are the world champions. The Orioles were determined to make amends in 1970, and the big red machine that was just now revving up was, thanks to injuries, stuck in neutral. We, we had everybody hurt. They're out. They're gone. I had two or three guys with bad arms, and we really took advantage of that. The Orioles averaged more than six runs a game and won the series four games to one. But the 70 series will always be remembered as the Brooks Robinson Show. Great play by Robinson. Look at oh, that. Oh, great day in the morning. What a play. About the third game, I said, man, I hope this thing gets over because I can't keep this up. This is unbelievable. We thought the balls were extra base hits. And he really took us out of the World Series with his glove. He's been the difference in the series. That's one and two. And the Reds say they should bar him. He's illegal. I don't think I ever had five games in a row like I had in that particular series. And for the second time in five years, Baltimore is the World Cup. In 71, Pittsburgh's Roberto Clemente took on an impossible mission of his own. The same type of performance that Brooks did the year before Roberto did that, uh, the following year. His goal was to show the people around the country and around the world what he had shown the people in the tri-state area around Pittsburgh for a lot of years. But against the World Series savvy Orioles, Clemente and the Pirates weren't given much of a chance. We were playing against a great ball club, the Baltimore Orioles, who had four 20-game winners. We had Dobson, Palmer, Cuellar, and McNally, and that's something that'll never happen again. Most people thought that we had no shot. I mean, we just said, well, we have no reason to even be here. We should just stay at home. They didn't already won. And the Orioles did win the first two games in Baltimore. But that's when Clemente took matters into his own hands. As we lost the, the second game in Baltimore, uh, Clemente came in the clubhouse and he started screaming and said that we're going to go back to Pittsburgh and we're going to kick their butts three games in a row. You have to have a player who believes that he can beat the supposedly better team. And we went back to Pittsburgh and we did exactly that. It was like a runaway truck on a downhill with no brakes. Clemente drove the Bucks to victory. What a throw! And Clemente beats it out. Clemente has done it all for the Pirates. Home run, Clemente! Be able to do all of those things that you hear a guy can do when everyone is watching. I mean, that's the, the epitome of being a, the best player there is. I'd probably have another World Series ring if it wasn't for him. Mike Clemente putting on a one-man show. Roberto homered in Game 7, and Steve Blass pitched a four-hitter. Pittsburgh had captured the World Series, and now everyone knew of the Pirates' greatest treasure. People started saying, well, now I understand what they were saying when they were talking about Roberto Clemente. In the 71 World Series, I saw what everybody was talking about. Clemente was definitely the difference in the series. Clemente has been named the outstanding player of the series. The 1972 World Series saw the Big Red Machine of Cincinnati face a lively, colorful, raucous band of Oakland Athletics who were changing the face of baseball. If we would have had a, a camera crew following us around, we could have had our own sitcom. But some kind of way, we all got together and, and we just kind of jailed. There's a long blast to deep left. That one is going and it is gone a home run for Gene Tennis. Gene Tennis got in the series groove early, hitting home runs in each of his first two at-bats. That's a World Series record. It was a feat that Tennis took in stride. 
kind of worked out where some knucklehead got hot and kind of picked up the slack. And while tennis did his part at the plate, outfielder Joe Rudy stepped to the fore with his glove. There's a long drive to deep left, that ball going, going, and it is caught by Rudy, Joe Rudy. When the ball left the bat, I thought it was out, I really did. And it was just a blessing because the, the ball was literally within an inch or two of the sun. And uh, I looked up and I just jumped as high as I could. I, I was as surprised as anybody that I caught the ball because I really did think it was out. Joe Rudy runs in an extra in a series marked by surprising performances, it was only right that the A's surprised the baseball world by defeating the heavily favored Reds in seven games. It was the A's first title in 42 years. I think after we beat them and everything, still the newspaper said that Cincinnati was better. We didn't care what to say, we won. The defending champion A's returned to the Fall Classic the following year, but this time the surprise team in attendance was the New York Mets, who never wavered from their mantra, you gotta believe. There was no question that we could beat those guys because we had what every team needed, and that was pitching. That pitching did neutralize the potent A's lineup, and timely hitting by the Mets put them in a position to win it all. But once the Amazons let game six slip away, then they had to face the fact that they'd awakened a sleeping giant. The Oakland A's that everybody knew and that we had read about slept for six games. They never showed up. But the seventh game, the real Oakland ball club showed up. Five ball to right field, hit pretty well. And there you go. The ball that Burt Campanaris hit for a home run opposite field was a curveball that I thought was a hell of a pitch. How he hit it, I still don't know. Every time I see him, we talk about it to this day. And the pitch Reggie hit should have been hit, maybe should have been hit further. I, plain and simple, hung a curveball, and he drilled it. There's a long drive. Jackson has hit it all. And it is gone. The A's had now captured two straight world championships, and they were making converts every step along the way. The question in 74 was, could they do it yet again? The Oakland A's are right on target into another World Series. They're third in a row. They're the defending world champs going against the youthful Dodgers who are back in for the first time since 1966. But even though Oakland was back in the series, not everyone was willing to give them credit. Out of bar, Billy! What hit that ball? Case in point, the Dodgers' Bill Buckner. Going into the World Series, Bill had made some statements in the paper that uh, only a couple of guys in the A's could play on the Dodgers team. That kind of upset the rest of us in that clubhouse, so somebody put that on the bulletin board. You gotta love those bulletin boards as the A's were inspired to triumph in a nail-biting five-game series. Most of the contests were tight, but the A's became the first team to win three straight championships in 22 years. The A's are the world champions! Man, I only went five games that one. That was a little shorter because the Dodgers made us mad. <laughs> In 1975, the A's bid to win a fourth straight title was thwarted by the Red Sox, who faced Cincinnati in the World Series. The first five games were exciting, and the Reds took a 3-2 lead. But then, a little rain fell on the World Series parade. When you have a World Series, there's a thousand reporters at the event, and they had nothing to do but write stories, and everyone in the country realized what we were doing and who it was that was doing it because of all the press. Five long days later, the buildup paid off as the Red Sox took a 3-0 lead at Fenway Park, only to watch it become a 6-3 deficit by the eighth. The Reds were now just four outs from the title when pinch hitter Bernie Carbo came up with two men on. Deep center field, way back, way back. We're tied up. And as I round the second base, I'm yelling at Pete Rose, don't you wish you were this strong? Don't you wish you were this strong? And Pete Rose is yelling at me. Isn't this what World Series is about? Isn't this fun? Three pressure-packed innings later, Dwight Evans kept the game tied at six. Back near the wall, and oh, what a catch he made! Dewey's defense had set the stage for one of the most memorable moments in World Series history. Now it's the 12th inning, and I'm on the on-deck circle with Fred Lynn, and I said, Freddie, 
I don't know, but I feel something good here. I'm going to hit one off the wall, drive me in. We were talking about it on, on deck before he went up there, and he said, you know, I'm going to get on. You, you drive me in. Well, he hogged the show. <laughs> After that, it's almost like your mind just goes blank. It goes dull. Everything kind of, the sounds are muffled, and you just make sure you touch every base. It was such a special moment, you know, and it's what American sports is all about. It's our Americana almost. Uh, baseball, hot apple pie, and called Fisk. Fisk's ultra dramatic home run made game six indelible. But the next night in game seven, the joy in Beantown ended as the Reds won it. Overall, I don't think it had anything to do with who won or lost. The only people that won this are the fans that watched. 1976 saw the return of the Yankees to the World Series, propelled there by Chris Shambliss's League Championship Series winning home run against Kansas City. Mark Littell delivers high drive. It's in right center field. That's good. The World Series would now be back in New York for the first time in 12 years. A thrilling, a thrilling. The way that game ended against Kansas City, I mean, we partied pretty hard after that because it was the biggest thrill we've any of us have ever, ever had at that time. But the euphoria was short-lived as the defending champions crashed the party. I got news for you. We're going to be world champions again, Sugar Bear. We are now going to be world champions again. That was a huge moment for us. Back to back, we'd swept the playoffs, swept the Yankees. That was the and ultimate. That's it. The Cincinnati Reds win the World Series in four straight. And the Cincinnati Reds win their fourth world championship. The Yankees got another shot in 1977 when they squared off for the ninth time against their longtime rivals, the Dodgers. But this time, it was L.A. that seemed unprepared. We weren't quite ready for the Yankees, who had more experience, I think, at that point for us. The Yankees took a commanding 3-1 series lead. And though they failed to close it out in the fifth game at Dodger Stadium, the Dodgers got a peek at their future in Reggie Jackson's last at bat. There's a high drive. Right. Right. It's fair. It's fair. It's fair. It's 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 fair. It's it's fair. Fair. It's it's fair. But that was just the beginning, for Reggie was about to rock the Bronx. He knew that everyone would be watching. He knew that he had to step up big for us. Now listen to the ovation for Reggie Jackson. You were sensing the moment that this was going to be a, a great evening for Reggie. There's a drive to right field and deep. Chris going back, away back, it's gone. Home run, Reggie Jackson. Well, Reggie goes up the first inning, hits a home run. One pitch, uh, you don't think too much about it. But on the next pitch he saw, Reggie put another one into the seats. Counting his last at-bat in Los Angeles, he had now homered on three straight swings. Could he possibly make it four in a row? Well, he'd have to do it against a knuckleballer, Charlie Huff. Reggie Jackson has seen two pitches in the strike zone tonight, two, and he's in a boat in the seat. My main thought, the way the fans were reacting, was I cannot walk this guy. <laughs> And uh, I threw what I thought was a very good knuckleball. Goodbye. 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 Oh, what a blow! What a way to tough it off! Forget about who the most valuable player is in the World Series. You know, now you know this is history. You know, three home runs in the World Series game is certainly something that I'm very proud of. I don't think I understood the impact uh, that it would have on the game. Guys like DiMaggio and Mays and Aaron and Clemente, and I can now say that I had one day that was like those guys. When it was all over, I remember Reggie sitting in the manager's office talking about how next year was going to be great. And he was right, as the Yankees returned to the series to once again face the Dodgers. But this time, they lost the first two games in L.A. The frustrated Yankees headed back to the Bronx, where they saw a defensive display that defied belief by third baseman Greg Nettles. Nettles 
standing next to him and watching him, you know, a couple plays you just go, wow. All the difficult plays that he had to make with people on base just, you know, cut us right in half every time. In the next game, Reggie once again got in the way of the Dodgers' best laid plans. It was obstruction, no question about it. So it was a bad call, and he should have been called out. Wait a minute. He's standing right there. And what he's standing right there. He can't stand up. You have to give uh, Reggie a lot of credit for doing it, but then he got away with it. That's what hurt me more than anything else. Personally, I thought that was a smart play. I mean, he did act pretty good. I didn't like it against us. We just didn't handle it very well. I don't think we had enough time to mentally work ourselves through it. It was a big momentum swing as far as the World Series when, when that happened. Reggie's rump got him over the hump, and the Yankees took the next two games. In the process, they became the third back-to-back -back champions of the decade. Every time you win a World Series, it's one of the greatest things in the world, really. In 1979, the Pittsburgh Pirates led the National League in runs scored, but the Baltimore Orioles had great pitching. The Pirates, though, had a secret weapon. They were family. We did have a unique closeness on that ball club, and we called it the family. We took a theme song that Sister Sledge had made popular that year. We are family. And we adopted it as, as our theme song. And then I have to take my hat off because that's, that's kind of like my second national anthem. Through four games, Baltimore managed to keep the Pirates' bats at bay and got timely hits of their own to put them on the verge of their first world title since 1970. So Baltimore goes up three games to one. So Pops decided to call a family meeting. We expected to win that ball game because we felt that if we're going to lose, let's show the world that we haven't played and, and let's play like the Pirates are capable of playing. And the Pirates won games five and six. Then, in game seven. Hit well, right field. Singleton to the wall, and this ball is gone. Stargell's colossal blow had brought the family to the brink of an amazing comeback. Nice go, Will. That's the way to go, big man. All right, that's the way to put us in front. All right. The Bucks became the first team since 1968 to come back from a 3-1 deficit by winning games six and seven in Baltimore. When we won the World Series, it was like, who cares what anybody did? We were the champions of the world. In 1980, the Philadelphia Phillies finally made it back to the series, trying to give their frustrated fans their first ever title. Over the years, I mean, we let them down so many times, and we wanted them to know we were trying as hard as we could try. But now they'd have to beat George Brett and the Kansas City Royals, also looking for their first crown. The series went back and forth, each team refusing to lose in its own park. But in game five in Kansas City, the Phillies got a pivotal victory, putting them on the precipice of the championship. It all came down to a weary Tug McGraw. The crowd will tell you what happens. McGraw didn't have much left. He, he, he had a very tired arm, but he cranked it up one more time. It was one of those where you reach back for some extra 79 mile an hour fastball and uh, struck him out. We were world champions in a heartbeat. put all the demons to rest, so to speak, you know, and, uh, and it just needed to happen. A player strike shortened the 81 season, and the altered postseason format required teams to win two playoff series to reach the World Series. The Dodgers won the National League rights and hoped to meet their nemesis in the series. I'm saying, dear God, if you ever have a chance to put us into another 
fall classic. Please let it be against the Yankees. I want them so bad. And the Yankees have won the pennant. Now we have another chance against the dreaded Yankees. So what did we do? We lost the first two games of the series. Now all of a sudden dropping the first two games and everybody saying, oh, here it goes again. Yankees going to, they might even sweep the Dodgers. But this was now a playoff tested team, one that had a reputation for coming from behind. We were down two games to Houston. We came back and won that series three to two. We were down two games to one to Montreal. We won that series. So even though we were down two games coming out of New York, I never really doubted our chances. The Dodgers' confidence would be rewarded as they won the next three games at home and destroyed the Yankees' spirit in the process. That set up a shot for sweet revenge as the Dodgers had a chance to win it all at Yankee Stadium. It presented us an opportunity to come back and to rewrite a chapter that we kept reading over and over and over. The Dodgers are the 1981 champions of baseball. It was really kind of a culmination of all the hard work and effort. So I finally got even with the Yankees after beating us twice in the World Series. Finally, we got them. Baseball in the crazy 80s taught us that no uniform is too bright, no style too magical, and of course, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Anything could happen, and it did. That was certainly the case in the 82 World Series, where the speedy St. Louis Cardinals took on the heavy-hitting Milwaukee Brewers. I love the nickname of the uh, Milwaukee Brewers. Harvey Keene was the manager, and somebody slapped the tag on this team as Harvey's Wall Bangers, and a great moniker and that that's exactly what they weren't but it was the cardinals who made a big bang in game three led by slap hitting rookie willie mcgee uh oh more going back mcgee will touch them all that's two for mcgee what a day that gets at it one home run for a guy that hit only four all season was a story but for mcgee to hit two in one world series game uh, he found his moment McGee also had a moment in the ninth with a spectacular catch. McGee is doing everything to become the star. The series would climax with a seventh game in St. Louis. Going into that game, of course, we were all very nervous, but we were confident that if we played our game, that it, uh, we had a good chance of winning. And closer Bruce Souter made sure that's what happened. A swing and a miss, and that's the winner! That's the winner! A World Series winner for the Cardinals! While the Cardinals ruled the roost in 82, it was the Orioles who flocked to the series in 83. We were definitely the underdog, and here we are going against the Philadelphia Phillies with names like Pete Rose, Joe Morgan, Mike Schmidt. These guys are the gods of baseball. But with the score tied at one in game one, it was another higher power who made his presence felt. About the seventh inning, the president gets up to leave, and he stops with Howard Cosell and starts telling baseball stories. And the game gets delayed. Anything that throws you out of your routine, you don't like, you know. You're on the mound, and you just seem to go on and on and on. I thought I said, forget it, let's pitch. He got cold at Scotty McGregor, and he gave up a home run, and the Orioles lost their only game they lost in the 83 World Series. And it's all the fault of the Gipper. So the Phillies won one for the Gipper, but the Orioles took the next three. And in game five, Eddie Murray made a name for himself with a pair of blasts. Eddie Murray has his two home runs and it's four to nothing Orioles. Eddie came up, he homered the right center field, and I never forget his name being on the board and the ball hitting on his name on the scoreboard. And just to make things perfect, game one's losing pitcher got revenge. And the Orioles are the world champions. I ran to the mound and hugged Scotty McGregor and lifted that orange catcher's mitt in the air. 
and I was thinking that we had finally done it. If the Orioles had felt like underdogs, imagine being the 84 Padres, having to face a Detroit Tigers team that began the regular season 35-5 and five and never looked back. We had the incredible start, and the feeling was is that we were, whoever we played, that we were going to win. Jack Morris did just that in game one, and then the bats took over. Trammell did most of the damage in Game 4, but the series' decisive blow was delivered in Game 5 by Kirk Gibson. Runners at second and third. The Tigers lead 5-4, eighth inning. And they will walk Gibson, I believe. I looked over at Sparky, and I said, he's not going to walk me. He don't want to walk you. Dick Williams comes out, and he goes, you want the infield in? He says, no. You want the infield in on him? No. Goose thought for sure. He can overpower him and go get him. I mean, you're talking about striking him out. Yeah. Williams comes out, and I said, hey, let's go after him. And that was the missile that sunk our ship. A long drive to right. Yeah. And it is a home run for Gibson. You don't want to walk him? No. Don't walk him. Don't walk him. A three-run homer. The Tigers lead it eight to four. And when I hit that home run, Everybody knew the series was ours, and, you know, it was time to start party in the city of Detroit. It's a happy bunch of tigers. There was no question that the World Series trophy would stay in the Midwest the next year as the Kansas City Royals faced the St. Louis Cardinals in the first-ever I-70 World Series. It was, uh, it was kind of a, a little storybook World Series because the first two games, we lost at home. And a gut-wrenching loss. The Royals and their fans totally stunned. At that point in time, there had been no team that had come back from losing the first two games at home to win a World Series. So, history was against us. Yes, but Cy Young Award winner Brett Saberhagen was on the Royals' side, and they came back. Still, they needed a bit of good fortune, and three outs from elimination in Game 6, Kansas City got it. It became known as the call. A little scrubber to the right side, Worrell races over to cover, the throw doesn't get him. We got a favorable call at first. We got a break. The call went our way. Could have gone the other way. Looks like he's out. Oh, yes. I don't think there's any doubt about it. That particular play happened, and the next guy comes up and hits a pop-up toward the first base dugout that wasn't caught. Clark can't make the play. You start warning, oh, no, what's going on here? What it was was a royal flush. In Game 7, the frustrated Cardinals had no chance against Saberhagen, who conspired with his third baseman to plot their post-game celebration. I said, you know, when this guy makes the last out, and he will make the last out, just kind of hanging around the mound here, I want to be the first one on the mound. And uh, sure enough, that's what happened. The Kansas City Royals are the 1985 world champions. The Royals had bucked history, but this was merely a precursor of 1986. And the Red Sox, who were supposedly the three to one underdog team, have swept two in New York. And we'll see if it continues at Fenway. It didn't. The Red Sox lost two of three at home. And the series returned to New York for game six. There, Boston held a two run lead with two out on the 10th. It looked to all of us like the curse of the Bambino was about to end. Bob Costas was in the Red Sox visiting clubhouse and had the stage set, champagne was ready to be poured. And when I came to the plate, I just knew in my heart, I'm not gonna be the last out. Line into left field, base hit for Carter, and the Mets are still alive. Third ball, and that's gonna be hit to center, base hit. And now suddenly with two out in the 10th inning, the tying runs are aboard, and Ray Knight will be the batter. No big deal. But <laughs> still, this is, how, how can they come back? Gets 0-2 on me, and I'm looking hard away, and he busts a fastball up and in on me. And that's going to be hit into center field, base hit. Here comes Carter to score, and the time run is at third in Kevin Mitchell. Odds of them getting hits, you know. You're just hoping that one of our guys would throw a ball a foot outside or something, because I think all the hits came with like 0-2 on, on three or four different batters. 2-2 two two to Mookie Wilson. Buddy Harrison had just told me, Mitch, be prepared for a ball in the dirt. And it's going to go to the backstop. Here comes Mitchell to score the tying run. And Ray Knight is at second base. 
defense can win you a championship. And so, too, can it help you lose one. That morning, I had written a column asking the question of whether Buckner should play or not. And I ended by saying that people should practically say a prayer for Buckner, that he had tried so hard and contributed so much but was so battered that something sad shouldn't happen to him, but that the, the fates usually found players like that. Little roller up along first, behind the back! I don't remember ever touching ground. It was like I floated to home plate. The Mets are not only alive, they are well, and they will play the Red Sox in Game 7. And win 8-5 over the star-crossed Red Sox. Strike out! Strike out! Let's win it! The Mets have won it! In 1987, the Cardinals made their third series appearance in six years, though injuries had saddled both Jack Clark and Terry Pendleton. As for their opponents, well, just being there proved that almost anything can happen. The Minnesota Twins go into the World Series having been outscored. They were out hit in terms of average. They were out homered, and they were out pitched in terms of earned run average. They were out everything. But they did have the ultimate home field advantage, a deafening dome. hear yourself think the Homer hankies and the whole deal, you know. Now we know what sound feels like. It's gotta be physical to watch Boy. a game here. You could kind of see with the way that we play that uh, they made it very, very tough. Inspired by their fans, the Twins won all four of their home games, including a dome rattling game seven. The Gaetti for the first time. A title for favored St. Louis just wasn't in the cards. But in 1988, it seemed like Oakland held a hand that couldn't be beat. When you talk about our lineup, there weren't many little guys in it. <laughs> you go to me, Conseco, McGuire, Parker, Lansford, Steinbeck, we've demolished some people. The A's opponents in 88 were the Dodgers. And while they did have the Cy Young and MVP award winners, the latter wasn't expected to play. The lead up to the World Series was like, well, you know, how badly are we going to beat the Dodgers? We expected to win. Grand slam home run for Jose Canseco. With Canseco providing the power and the best closer in the game coming on to protect a one run lead, game one looked to be a foregone conclusion. Up around the bag and I got Sosa to pop up, so I thought I was golden. As soon as I popped him up, I said, that's that. Not so fast. A two-out walk by Eckersley, just his 14th all year, opened the door for the Dodgers' hobbled slugger. The clubhouse boy came to me and said, Gibson wants to see you up in the runway. So I go up there, and there's Kurt. He said, Skipper, I think I could hit for you. So I said, great. You know, he needed a long time to get there, so it was driving me nuts. It's like, to get this guy up here. He's the last out. Let's get this thing over with. You got your foot on their throat, you want to put them away. Gibson physically unable to start tonight with two bad legs. You talk about a roll of the dice, this is it. Gibson worked the count full and then guessed. Away. I stepped out of the box and said to myself, partner, sure as I'm standing here breathing, you're going to throw me that 3 2 backdoor slider, aren't you? They were stunned, and it shook them up so bad, it paralyzed them, and they never were really able to recover. While Gibson's dramatic blast provided the spark, it was Oral Hershiser who fanned the flames, not to mention 17 A's, as the Dodgers won a tidy five-game series. Got it. They've done it. It's the impossible dream revisited. The A's returned to the World Series in 1989, still smarting from their defeat to the Dodgers and ready for their showdown with their Bay Area rivals, the San Francisco Giants. And the early returns did look promising. The A's lead two games to nothing. 
Then the series moved across the bay to San Francisco, and out of the clear blue sky, everything changed. We went on the air at 5 o'clock Eastern time, and I started talking about Dave Parker, and I could hear it. It was the sound that was perhaps the most ominous. At second base, so the Oakland A's take it. Take it. I'll tell you what, we're having a great That's the greatest open in the history of television, bar none. In the midst of the fall classic, a seismic shift had rocked the baseball world. First time I ever got scared in yeah. I got knocked down a lot, but this is the first time I ever got scared. When you get back to your houses, wherever you're living in, you see, you know, you know, this freeway's collapsed and killed hundreds, and the marina's on fire, and uh, the Bay Bridge had a big section collapse. You, you know, you sort of got the gravity of it, and you're like, hey, wait, oh, ooh, this is not good at all. We are postponing the game because there is no power in the stadium. We would like you to leave in an orderly way. As the residents of the Bay Area picked up the pieces of their lives, Commissioner Faye Vincent kept the games on hold. It would be the longest such delay in World Series history. When the game did resume, which was 10 days later, there, there was really no emotion at all. I mean, you know, Oakland wound up winning the next two games and swept us, but it was sort of anticlimactic after that. These are the world champions. I think we probably won the most historic World Series of all time. They have to deal with the delay and the emotional tugs and still come out and play competitive baseball. I don't know anybody's had to do more than that to win, win a world championship or compete for the world championship. In 1990, the A's became the first team in more than a decade to reach the World Series three consecutive years. This time, they faced the Reds, who despite going wire to wire, came in as heavy underdogs. No one gave us a chance uh, at really winning. They thought we might win one or two games. We didn't think Cincinnati was that good, and that was a mistake. And in the very first inning of the very first game, Eric Davis let that be known. Won the World Series. When Eric hit that home run, I, I think that was it. You know, they knew that, okay, it's on. While Davis set the tone for the series, Reds ace Jose Rio made it stick, allowing just one run in his two series wins. In the end, the nastiest boys on this team resided in the bullpen. That bullpen dominated the nasty boys. Debo and Charlton and Randy Myers, they just... Uh... <laughs> they were at the top of their game and they threw hard. In fact, this exceptional trio wouldn't be scored upon in almost nine full innings of work. That's right for the A's. Somber and stunned. Stunned to the tune of a three games to none deficit as the Reds embarked on one of the most unlikely sweeps in World Series history and their fifth franchise title. Popped up in the short right. Bensinger wants it. Cincinnati, the champions of baseball. At the end of the four games after we swept them, I think they understood that, you know, you might have better players man for man, but you better have a better unit when you take the field. And I, I think that's what we showed them. No one expected us to do the things that we did. That was a special club, and I'll never, ever forget that club. The Cincinnati Reds have done the absolute improbable. You know, when you look back on it, you think about, let's get off to a good start, and anything can happen. And it happened. We end up being the world champions. After a decade of mostly surprise champions, the 91 series featured two surprises, the Twins and the Braves, both worst to first World Series qualifiers. Glad to be here, they filled the series with excitement thanks to constant game-ending heroics.
I remember us going back to Minnesota, having to win only one game, because we had won all three at home. But home in the Dome that year was just as precious. And in game six, Kirby Puckett took matters into his own hands. I told the guys that came to the clubhouse, and I called them to meet, and I said, guys, don't worry about it today. You guys jump on my back. I'm going to carry you today. In just the third inning, Kirby made his point. He corks it to left center and chased by Puckett. He caught it. Oh, Kirby Puckett with a great grab in left center field. Then in the bottom of the 11th, with the game tied at three apiece, Kirby Puckett was primed for an encore. I told Chili Davis, I said, oh, Bunny, get on base. And Chili uh, said, Bunny, he said, bump my, you know what? He said, get up there, get a good change up, hang and change up, and hit it out. Let's go home. And I said, okay, I'll do that. Into deep left center for Mitchell. see you tomorrow night. The Dome was in a frenzy as the future Hall of Famer had both come through in the clutch and set the stage for a classic. They gave us a chance to see one of the best games of all times, you know, Mr. Smoltz against Mr. Morris, game seven. Going through that first seventh game of the World Series against a guy I grew up just watching my whole career was great. The pressure of a decisive game seven didn't phase the winningest pitcher of the 80s. Just watch Jack Morris work. He is a war horse. And right from the start, both pitchers were on their game. And Smoltz is off on the right foot with a strikeout. In the eighth, fans might have thought that Morris had reached his limit, what with runners on second and third, and Tom Kelly making the walk from the dugout. TK came out, he smiled, which he's done several times when he's taken me out. And I just stood there like, I'm going to kill you if you take me out. His subtle persuasion did the trick. And following an intentional walk, Morris sought to prove that it was the right move. And the play is to home. Out there. Out there. Jack Morris did not want to come out of that ball game. You could see he was determined. If that game went 18 innings, Jack Morris still would have stood out there in the 18th inning. Smoltz proved a worthy adversary, but he departed in the eighth. This unbelievable game seven went scoreless into the 10th, and now Morris needed closure, and her pinch hitter, Gene Larkin. One out. The Twins are gonna win the World Series! The Twins have won it. It's a base hit. It's a one nothing 10 inning victory. I remember sitting there thinking, we just let this one get away, because I really thought we were the better team. So I mean, my, my heart was just hurt. Heart and determination brought the Braves back to the Fall Classic the following year. But in their way was a team and a country making its World Series debut and a hungry Blue Jays veteran in search of his first championship. Toronto team in 1992. I thought that when I came there, I, that we could put it all together and win it. It was a talent-laden club, but after losing game one in Atlanta and on the brink of another loss in game two, the hopes of bringing a title to Canada were in jeopardy. Until that is, a lesser known Blue Jay rocked the South. One of the big turning points in that series was uh, Ed Sprague hitting the home run to put us ahead. Well hit to left field. Home run, Ed Sprague! Off the bench with a pinch hit two run homer. After winning game two and taking two of three in Toronto, the Blue Jays returned to Atlanta, where an 11th inning hit would be the stuff of dreams. It was the 11th, and you know, it's same thing, two outs, men on base. The way you finish every practice when you're a kid, you're up, men on base, you know, your time to do something in the big game, boom. Down the line, a base hit, into the left field corner. White has scored, Alomar comes around. It's a two-run double for Dave Winfield. To hit a double and stand in the middle, kind of the epicenter of the ballpark, and 50,000 people, you only have maybe 
1,000 cheering for you because they're stunned, they're shocked, they're on their heels, and they know what might be coming. For the first time in history, the World Championship banner will fly north of the border. That's as good a feeling as you can get because they're standing there looking at you like that dirty, that guy, you know, and you just feel good and you guys are cheering for you. So that's as good as it gets. With the Blue Jays hoping to repeat in 93, they'd have to overcome a Phillies team that was tough as nails. We knew that the Phillies that year, they were a very, very feisty club, a scrappy club. It was one heck of a series. I mean, it was back and forth between two really good ball clubs. And he hits one deep to right. Forget about it. Way out of here. Game four alone featured a World Series record 29 runs in the rain. Henderson to the plate with the go-ahead run. Yeah, baby, yeah. With Toronto up three games to one, Philadelphia's hopes rested on the arm of Kurt Schilling who threw a complete game shutout to send it back to Canada. Kurt Schilling ended up throwing a gem in game five that pushed us to game six, but we were still up 3-2, and we didn't want to see a game seven. Toronto was looking to become the first team to repeat in 15 years, but trailed 6-5 to five in the ninth inning of game six. With the tying run on second and the winning run on first, Joe Carter came slowly to the plate, ready to duel with Philly closer Mitch Williams. I was not thinking home run at the time. It never entered my mind. I just knew that somehow, some way, the game was going to revolve around what I did that particular at bat. Two strikes, I know I can get him to swing at something that's not a strike. And that's why the next pitch was supposed to be up and away. I'm trying to get him to chase out of the strike zone. And and either he's going to strike out on it or he's going to hit a weak fly ball to right field. But don't miss down and in. Well hit down the left field line. Way back and go! Joe Carter with a three-run homer. I didn't have to look. I knew as soon as he hit it, it was gone. Watching everything unfold right in front of you and the fans and the World Series ends, uh, you know, with me standing in center field, it was kind of like the twilight zone out there, the way it just happened. It's a job, and sometimes you get, sometimes you get got. I touch home plate, and I just, just let it go. And with everybody on top of me, I mean, it was, it was great. Toronto's shot at a three-peat was put on hold in 1994 as the piercing silence of a labor dispute sent shivers through the baseball world and ended with a fan's worst nightmare. Everyone in baseball knew what was going to happen. All the insiders knew. I'm really sorry. I wish this day obviously had never happened. Knowing the animosity between the union and management, I don't think anybody could have been surprised world of change and flux and a century of war and disruption. One thing was always there, the World Series. 1994 it wasn't. On the field of dreams, a giant anti-climax. Yes, the baseball season is over. The absence of the World Series in October was a void some will never forget. All of a sudden, uh, the work stoppage came and we looked up and we're in first place and, and it was like, you know, hey, we, we had a pretty good shot to win this thing. I felt like we were the best team. I just felt like we were getting better all the time. But nobody, I don't think, thought that there would be no World Series. We were primed to make a good run at it. And to have that rug pulled out from underneath us was, uh, was very tough to think about. For some, the missed opportunity to play in a World Series was a momentary setback. For one of Showalter's own Yankees, however, it couldn't have happened at a worse time. Reaching, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel, you know, I just didn't get a chance to get to that final light. You know, it got to pretty bright, 
where it was getting close, but I just didn't get to that last little rung, you know. That was what was disappointing part of my career is not getting a chance to play in the World Series. But Mattingly's failure to satisfy his World Series hunger has been felt throughout baseball history. Just ask legends Rod Carew, Ralph Kiner, Billy Williams, and many others who can only say what if. For five years after I retired, I mean, I had dreams almost every three nights about playing in the World Series. And then I would wake up <laughs> in a cold sweat and say, God, it's just not happening. I love to pitch, and I thought I did a pretty good job at it. But I didn't get any postseason play to maybe prove to myself that I was maybe a little step better. A lot of things have to happen from a positive standpoint for you. you got to have a lot of things that you know work uh, in your favor, uh, luck being probably at the top of the list. A little bit of luck and some hard work got baseball back on track in 1995. And with it, a familiar team continued to chase its own World Series dream. But in the Braves' way were the Cleveland Indians, who'd gone 144 in the shortened regular season with baseball's most prolific offense. So the 95 World Series was a showdown of great hitting against awesome pitching. Globbing is globbing. Modest is modest. Smooth is smooth. And whenever you were facing that quality pitcher, you're going to have to go out and try to do the best you can. Half swing, got him. Three up, three down. Game one starter Greg Maddox pitched a two-hit complete game gem for the Braves. One down, three to go. The Braves win game one on a superb pitching effort by Greg Maddox. Awesome performance, a tremendous display of control and, and movement on pitches, and he completely frustrated Cleveland. Tom Glavin was next in line to stymie the Indians and help give Atlanta a commanding two games to none lead. When the series shifted to Cleveland, the Indians' bats finally came alive, and in the bottom of the 11th of a tie game, they were rewarded for their perseverance. He lines it into center. Here comes the pinch runner, Espinosa. Grissom fires to the plate. The Indians are back in the World Series. But not for long, as a Game 4 loss put them in dire straits. Lose and go home. Win and go south. Back to Georgia. But Game 2 winner Tom Glavin was poised to erase any hopes Cleveland had of coming back. When I walked off the mound in the first inning, I knew I had, I knew I had what I wanted. I couldn't have asked for better stuff, so to speak. Struck him out. After throwing six scoreless innings, Glavin still needed runs to back him up. Up came David Justice, who'd been struggling for weeks. A long drive to right. Ramirez turns to the track. She's gone. As each inning went on, you got closer to the ninth inning. You knew how much that one run meant. It remained the only run in the game. And Glavin, who eventually put discretion over valor after eight innings, had pitched one of the best games in World Series history. As much as I would have loved to pitch a complete game shot out selfishly and just felt like the best thing to do would be to get Wollers out there and get our closer on the mound. I didn't want to go out there and, and blow it in the ninth inning when we had a guy like him waiting in the wings. Left center field. Grissom on the run. The team of the 90s has its world championship. Over the full season, there's little doubt the Cleveland Indians were the best team in baseball in 1995. That was probably one of the greatest offensive teams ever assembled, and I think we held them to a batting average of about 176 in that series. But for a week in October, the edge belonged to the Atlanta Braves. 95 and ended the way we wanted it to end, and like I said, there's no greater feeling. They have been baseball's best team over the last five years, and finally, the one missing piece is in place. synonymous with baseball excellence. The October Classic is back in the Bronx. 
1996 marked a return to the World Series for the game's most successful franchise. For the first time in 15 years, the Yankees could reclaim the October glory that had been so much a part of their past. Their opponent, seeking to defend its title, was the Atlanta Braves, for whom things looked good early, thanks to rookie Andrew Jones. Another home run for Andrew Jones. What a performance by the 19-year-old. Jones became the youngest player ever to hit a World Series home run and just the second man of any age to hit home runs in each of his first two World Series at bats. Despite losing the first two games, the Yankees skipper didn't panic. Everybody had written this off because we're going on the road down two games to none. But I happen to say to George that we'll go to Atlanta, we'll win three games there and come back and win a few next Saturday. And he looked at me like I had two heads. The Yankees did win the first game in Atlanta. And in the next, Jim Leyritz capped a stirring six-run comeback. In the air to left field. Back at the track at the wall. We are tied. Six-six here in the eighth. What a remarkable comeback by the Yankees. We felt, you know what, this is our destiny. And uh, then that game four turned completely around. And, really gave us an idea that, hey, you know what? We got a chance to beat these guys. The Yankees hang on and win 8-6, and this series is tied at two games apiece. In game five, Andy Pettit and John Smoltz waged a classic pitcher's duel. Five strikeouts already for Smoltz. What a start for Andy Pettit tonight. That's number 10. But it was Pettit who'd prevail over the veteran Smoltz, and the Yanks went on to win in dramatic fashion. Ball game, Yankees win one to nothing. We knew after we won that game, we're going back to New York. You know, there's just no way that we're going to lose. When the teams returned to New York, it was clear that those dark days of Yankees baseball were finally a thing of the past. Hayes waits. The Yankees are champions of baseball. They have surmounted every challenge. They have climbed every mountain. They are celebrating the organization's 23rd world title. We did it right here. We did it. Joe, I got a little cocktail for you, buddy. <laughs> The 1997 World Series featured at least one unlikely participant. In just their fifth year of existence, the expansion Florida Marlins were already bidding for a title. Opposing them, an old-school Cleveland team, with no intention of being upstaged by these new kids on the block. The Cleveland Indians have been around for a long time, playing the Florida Marlins, who haven't been around so long. The mindset was, we don't want to let this team that's so new win a world championship. Miami was so excited to see baseball in October, it rubbed off on the Florida players. The energy and the noise, the vibration in that stadium was unbelievable. And I remember the hair standing up on the back of my neck, and I was like, OK, this is the World Series. From the tropical heat in Florida to the bone-chilling cold of Ohio, this World Series was a study in extremes. Welcome to our winter wonderland here at Jacobs Field. It is the World Series. You know, you can't think about the weather. They have to play in it, too. The coldest game in World Series history. We did everything possible to stay warm. And the climate change was reflected in the nature of this series. Back to back. As neither team won back-to-back -back games all series long. Got it. Pretty incredible with the, the the seesaw battles back and forth. We won game one, they won two, we won three, it was back and forth like that all the way to game seven. In that final game, Cleveland took a 2-1 lead to the bottom of the ninth. But with one out and runners on the corners for Florida, Craig Council had a chance to tie it. That guy is a money player. And you know, I knew that, well, you know, we got the right guy up there. You know, after we tied up, there was so much, so much pressure and so much hype going on. It was just, uh, it was unbelievable. With the score still even at two, the game moved to the bottom of the 11th. Up came Edgar Renteria, barely 21 years old. We just said the game is over. The, the, the right guys are up there at the right time. The 0-1 pitch. A liner. Just 
unbelievable. You know, this is the most amazing thing that ever happened in my career. For me, it was it was one of the best seven games I've ever seen and ever been in. And something I'll never forget. The Yankees were back in the World Series picture in 1998 and with added pressure to succeed, thanks to a record-setting regular season. Everyone expected us to go to the World Series and win the World Series and breeze through the playoffs, so there were some high expectations on this. They were now just four wins away from perhaps the greatest season in Major League history, and in the World Series, the San Diego Padres got an early sign that magic had returned to the Bronx. Swung on a joke, deep to right. There it goes. That ball is gone. A grand slam into the upper deck. Oh, what a home run for Tino Martinez. That's what I remember about uh, the 1998 World Series. Watching that, that grand slam go out of there and just watching the people go crazy. The Yankees were feeling it with timely plays. Oh, what a catch by O'Neill. And late game heroics. It really struck me when I saw the emotion on his face. I mean, how could you not be pumped in the World Series in this type of situation? But that's one of the great performances in, in World Series history and Yankee World Series history. It was only fitting that the series MVP, third baseman Scott Brocious, would put the cap on the sweep. Get on the ground on a hop to Brocious. Fields throws across. Ball game over. World Series over. Boy, if I had one word, it'd probably just be storybook. Yankees win. The Yankees win. This team, as far as what it's accomplished to this point, it's it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. A lifetime. We will probably never see this again. The 1998 was a difficult year to follow, but these Yankees had resolve. We didn't live up to the expectations of the 98 team, but we were able to, to do even better in the postseason. The 1999 World Series would be a rematch of 96, and it was obvious that the Bombers meant business. They disposed of the Braves in four straight, giving them a postseason record that year of 11 and 1. And they won their 12th consecutive World Series game in the process. Ball game over! World Series over! The New York Yankees, world champions, team of the decade, most successful franchise of the century. It's a team of guys that have put personal things aside, that have put individual goals aside for this one team goal. And when you look and you just see in everybody's face, yeah, this is what it's all about, uh, that's what I remember. The New York Yankees have once again reached the pinnacle of the sports world. It just seems like every year that there's a fairy tale ending to, to our season and, and stuff magical happens. For the Yankees to continue their run in 2000, they'd have to beat the New York Mets in the first Subway Series in 44 years. Let's go Yankees! Let's go Mets! Vamos Yankees! Yankees vamos! If you were in New York, you couldn't escape it. I mean, everything I heard or, or saw was, was the Subway Series. Right from the start, there was an unmistakable intensity in the Big Apple. This classic showdown went the Yankees' way very early on, and they emerged from the Bronx with a two-game lead. They did lose Game 3, their first World Series loss since 96, but it was just a bump in the road as they rebounded in Game 4 right off the bat. And Cheetah swings, it's a high drive to left. It is high, it is far, it is gone. And in Game 5, in Queens, they became kings once again. Yankees have once again reached the summit of the sports world. They've won their third straight championship. It's just amazing the fact that we have been able to do it year after year after year. In 2001, the Yankees reached the series for the fourth straight year, their 38th fall classic overall. It was just the first for Arizona, but a pair of 20 game winners quickly helped them shed their rookie image. Diamondbacks win, and they're up two games to none. 
the Yankees made their way back to a city still coping with the aftermath of September 11th. And before game three came a visit that stirred some hearts. It was an incredible show of support for getting back to normal uh, by, by the president. Very nice throw, Mr. President. Good stuff, good stuff. After the president delivered the night's first pitch, Mariano Rivera threw the last, and the Yankees took game three. In game four, the Yankees continued to feed off the pulse of their city, and the hallowed Bronx grounds that even wily veterans have come to fear. Crazy things happen in the full moon. Like being down by two in the ninth against Arizona's bullpen ace, with Tino Martinez at the plate, two outs, and a runner on. of defeat, tie the game at three. Now, a World Series first. A game in November. The Yankees already had a Mr. October in Reggie Jackson. Was a new title awaiting Derek Jeter? 3-2 pitch, swung on a drill to right field, going back Sanders, on the track, at the wall. See ya, see ya, see ya never hit a walk-off home run before. You dream of when you're a kid is to hit a home run in a key situation in the World Series, and to get an opportunity to do that is pretty overwhelming. You can't really put into words what the feeling is like. With the series now tied at two games apiece, how could Game 5 possibly top that? How about the same inning, same lead, same closer, two outs, and a runner on base? This time, for Scott Brocious. That one hit in the air to left field. Do you believe it? Goodbye, home run. They have done it again. This game is tied. I don't believe it. Deja vu. A two-out, game-time, two-run home run by Scott Brocious. Probably the most unbelievable feat in World Series history. It's being a little kid again. That's all it is. You're filled with so much excitement and adrenaline, especially on the heels of, of the night before. Just going around the bases going, wow, you know, no way did this happen again, and we still have a chance to win the game. And three innings later, the Yankees would do just that. Yankees win. They lead the series three games to two. They've done it again. Unbelievable. When you win a game in that fashion, you know, two outs in the ninth again, those are the stories that, that people are going to remember. You know, were you at game four? Were you at game five of the 2001 World Series? Because it was absolutely the most fun two games I think I've ever played in my life. Oh, my! Another miracle in the Bronx! But how things changed on the long flight back west. In Arizona for game six, the Diamondbacks dominated. Game six belongs to Arizona. Forcing game seven tomorrow night. So it was time for the final test. One game stood between Arizona's first title and the Yankees' fourth in a row. And in the eighth, it looked as if New York just might get it. And the Yankees with yet another reason to celebrate. The sight of Alfonso Soriano rounding the bases had to cause some hearts in the hometown stands to sink. But these Diamondbacks were determined to strike back. There was a, a, a real grim determination that uh, this team was going to make it happen. The Diamondbacks have tied it here in the ninth. It all came down to Luis Gonzalez. This is the situation you dream about. Bases loaded, game seven of the World Series. You have a chance to be a hero. Don't mess this thing up. The chance of a lifetime for Luis Gonzalez. And a little blooper. Great deal. Diamondbacks win. They're the world champion. Gonzalez did it. The Diamondbacks have unseated. The New York Yankees are the world champions. A feeling went through my body that I've never felt before. I felt uh, what a champion feels like. <laughs> You Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. Pump your horns, stop your feet, celebrate in Arizona. There's no question. The 2001 World Series is the best World Series ever. 
just looking at the historical record, I don't think anything else is, is really that close. It is 01. The 2002 series would be historic in its own right. The first ever all wild card World Series. It's game one of the World Series 2002, the Anaheim Angels and the San Francisco Giants. The Angels had waited more than four decades for the chance to take the series stage. And the Giants' Barry Bonds had endured a 17-year wait of his own. In Act 1, Bonds made the first statement. Oh, my God! After leading the Giants to victory in Game 1 of the series, Bonds was ready for an encore. The Angels won that second game, but in Game 3, Bonds made history. Bonds in the center field. Back at the wall. Another blast from Barry Bonds. Bonds had become the first player ever to hit home runs in his first three World Series games. And he led the Giants to a three games to two series lead, putting San Francisco on the doorstep of a championship. You tip your hat to them, but guess what? There's going to be a game six. Let's go, Pop. One more time. The San Francisco Giants are one win away from winning their first World Series. The Angels with their backs flat up against the wall. Early in game six, for the first time all series, the bats on both sides were silent with four innings of scoreless ball. But then San Fran got a giant surprise. John Dunstan, perhaps the most unlikely candidate to hit a home run of the Giants lineup, does just that. So the Angels called on red-hot reliever Francisco Rodriguez to keep the Giants at bay. But against this man, even he proved vulnerable. That is crushed deep into the night, and it's 4 to nothing, San Francisco. The Giants had taken a 5 nothing lead and now appeared a lock for the title. But that's when the Angels turned to their season-long good luck charm. They put the rally monkey up on the scoreboard, and this place went berserk. The, the fans just go crazy seeing that thing, and it gives us a nice boost of adrenaline to go up there and, and uh, try to kick butt. Spezio could put the Angels back in this game. The warning track for the wall. Then it was Darren Erstad's turn to close the gap. Smoked in the right. It's a one-run game. The Never Say Die Angels giving their fans a thrill down the stretch. Next, Troy Gloss capped the amazing rally. Belton, left field, in the gap. It's in there for a double. Here comes Miggins. Here comes Anderson. The Anaheim Angels have come all the way back. The Angels take the lead. Six to five. And with Troy Percival, they weren't about to relinquish it. Well, what was on the line with us as far as facing elimination in that series? Uh, I don't think I've ever been involved in a more exciting ballgame. We are going to Game 7 incredibly. The Angels and the Giants, Game 7. It's do or die tonight. John Lackey was trying to become the first rookie to win a deciding Game 7 since Babe Adams of the Pirates in 1909. I knew, you know, I had to step up. I was on short rest, so I was just going to go as hard as I could for as long as I could. Lackey showed the poise of a veteran, holding the Giants to one run through five. Now the Angels needed a hero at the plate, and they found just the man. A line drive down the right field line. With San Francisco finally looking like a beaten team, Anaheim prepared to finish them off. The Angels are one out away. Here's the pitch to Lofton. Fly ball, center field. Erstad says he's got it. Erstad makes the catch. The Anaheim Angels are the champions of baseball. Is that amazing? to an end as the Anaheim Angels win it all.
afternoon and welcome to Yankee Stadium, the site of the 2003 World Series. The Yankees were there for the sixth time in eight years. A beautiful night in the Bronx. Game one of the Fall Classic. It's the Fish and the Yanks. The wild card Florida Marlins had gotten to the postseason by recording the second best record in the majors after they changed managers in May. Well, they were 75 and 49 under Jack McKeon. You're seeing a relaxed club out there, uh, not worrying about whether they make a mistake. And basically, we're not supposed to be here, so let's go out and have fun. And flying under the radar seemed to suit the underdog Marlins just fine as the series got underway. They sent the Yankees to their first World Series home loss since 1996. And the Florida Marlins have beaten the New York Yankees in game one. Winning game one's big. I think we can put a lot of pressure on them for tomorrow and, you know, hopefully we take game two. Well, that didn't happen as the Yankees earned a split and they take a two games to one lead in Florida, thanks in part to an all-time record 19th postseason home run by Bernie Williams and Mariano Rivera's 30th postseason save as part of their 6-1 victory. Tonight, here in Miami, Game 4 of the 2003 World Series. There's nobody here who believes that if the Marlins lose this game, they are going to come back against the Yankees and win. With such a daunting task ahead, McKeon called on Carl Pavano to pitch the biggest game of his career. You know, we had a lot riding on that game, and it's, it's a huge series, and you got to let it all hang on now because you never know if you're going to get this chance again. Carl Pavano has turned in seven outstanding innings. Ah, but a blown save by Ugeth Urbina in the ninth gave New York new life. The Yankees have tied the game a triple by Ruben Sierra. It remained a nail-biting 3-3 game until Alex Gonzalez came up in the 12th. Now the left field line, that ball is trouble. Into the corner, goal! Gonzalez, the Marlins win! And this World Series is all even again. If you go down 3-1, it's a big time uphill climb, but when you even it up 2-2, I think the momentum really, really changed in our favor. Well, we're back where we started, right here at Yankee Stadium. The Marlins roll in after winning two of three at home. They're up three games to two. With the title so close, McKeon went to Josh Beckett on just three days rest against the Yankees' 2003 postseason ace, Andy Pettit. A classic pitcher's duel was in the making. Andy is changing his speeds beautifully tonight. Power against power, and Beckett won that battle. No doubt in my mind that he was going nine innings. Believe me, I was not going to take him out. The way he pitched, he deserved to go all the way and win it. And after the Marlins scored a pair, Beckett got that chance to pitch a complete game clincher. Slow chopper. Beckett may make the final play. Pats him out. The Marlins win. The fish is swam upstream. Are the world champions? Just a great feeling. You can't really explain it. You know, you see all the guys jumping on, piling on each other, you know, throughout the other championships, but you, until you experience it, you, you can't really explain it. In 2004, Boston entered the World Series with incredible momentum, thanks to the most dramatic league championship series comeback in baseball history. First team ever to win a series, went down three games to nine. For more than 80 years, the curse of the Bambino had haunted Boston fans. And now they were eager to see it finally come to an end. The first time since 1986 they get a chance to see their beloved Red Sox in a World Series. But they'd have to beat a powerful St. Louis team that got to the World Series after 105 regular season wins. We expect to see a lot of offense. It's 9-9 in the eighth. Fly ball deep down the right field line by the pesky ball. Homer's in his third straight postseason game. Boston took game one 11 9 with the 20 combined runs, the most ever in a World Series opener. The Boston Red Sox have won game one of the 100th World Series. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Fenway Park for game two of the 2004 World Series. A hobbled Kurt Schilling took the mound for Boston, not long after sutures were reinserted to stabilize the tendon in his right ankle. Swing and a miss by Anderson. Strike three. That medical procedure to attend to the ankle of Kurt Schilling seems to have worked. Just wish everybody on this planet could experience the day that I just experienced. It's just the most amazing day of my life. 
a day and night capped off by a 6-2 victory that gave Boston a two-game advantage. St. Louis played host to its first World Series game since 1987, and amidst the rain, the Cardinals were hoping to continue their good fortune at home. The Cardinals this postseason 6-0 here at home. But the Sox had a powerful weapon in Manny Ramirez. His two RBIs led Boston to a 4-1 victory and a three-game-to-none series lead. The Boston Red Sox are one victory away after 86 years of winning a World Series for the first time since 1918. Well, you know what's at stake here. The Boston Red Sox, one win away from trying to do something that the franchise hasn't accomplished in 86 years. Let's go. Got to have it. Got to have it. And this would be the night. Swing and a shot ripped into right Way field. back it goes. It is going to put Boston on top. He swings and hits a fly ball to deep right center. Way back. Way back. It's off the wall. Here comes Baratek. And a two-run double by Trot Nixon. Gives the Red Sox a 3 nothing lead. With Keith Folk on the mound of the ninth, any remnants of the curse were swept away. Back to Folk. Red Sox fans have longed to hear it. After 86 years, the Boston Red Sox are the champions of the baseball world. It's just a, a tremendous accomplishment for, for this team and the city. And 86 years of frustration is finally over. In 2005, there were two teams looking to break long-standing droughts. When you talk about these two teams still playing this deep into the season, nobody believed it would be the White Sox and the Astros for the whole thing. Houston had never been in a World Series, and the White Sox hadn't won one since 1917. We're going to face a pretty good pitching staff, sort of them. This game is going to be whoever executes better, whoever makes less mistakes, whoever got the clutch hitting is the one going to win. And in game one, Chicago's Joe Creedy executed at the plate quite nicely. Swing, long one, deep left center, gone for a home run. Creedy has untied the score, Sox late 4-3. It's definitely, you know, a great feeling, you know, something you've always dreamt about when you were a kid. And uh, I was around the base. I said, OK, we have a one-run lead. You know, we want to hold these guys you know, for the rest of the game. And Joe did more than his part when he took his magic out onto the field. Pretty dies. Got it. Gets up. Throws the first. Bang a star on that. Just put the World Series on his shoulders. The White Sox won game one. Then a night later, they continued their flair for the dramatic down by two in the seventh. It's going to go. It's a slam. Sox lead. 6 4. What a good swing we have had here in Chicago. Houston fought back game lead to tie it again at six. But Chicago was determined to light the South Side up, and still another late game hero would emerge, this time in the night. Hot Sednik hits one to deep right center field. And it's a goner. A White Sox winner. A winner on a Pachetnik home run. Oh It's a proud night here for the fans in, in Houston. It was the first time a World Series game had taken place in the Lone Star State. It would also become, by time, the longest fall classic contest ever. The first World Series game played in Texas goes extra innings. What a fight for game three. One, two, three, they go. In the extra innings, you know, at any point, you know, any pitch, the game could be over. And waiting to do something special with that pitch in his first at-bat was Jeff Blum. Game number three will go to the 14th inning. Swing, there's a smash deep to right field, down the line. That ball is a home run. And the White Sox lead 6-5. to five. That at-bat by Blum was symbolic of our season. Everybody, there, every game, somebody has stepped up. Chicago was now on the verge of a sweep, but Houston wouldn't go away. And in the fourth game of the series, a great pitching duel shaped up. Swinging, missing, striking out. Two strikeouts in the inning, seven in the game for Freddy Garcia. Five strikeouts in a row for Brandon Becky. The scoreless tie continued into the seventh inning when series MVP Jermaine Dye came through with his seventh hit of the series. Face at the center. Harris scores. The White Sox have a 1-0 lead in the eighth. A lead the White Sox determined would not be lost 
no matter the cost. He dives into the stand. Did he catch it? He's got it! Unbelievable! Juan Uribe's next big play took place on the diamond, and it clinched the title for the White Sox. Oh, and the White Sox have won the World Series! The World Champion! Yeah. Yeah. This is the best day of my life right now. I don't care whatever else I do in this game. Nothing feels like this right here. The 2006 World Series featured the St. Louis Cardinals and Detroit Tigers, a rematch of the 68 Classic, which had been won in seven games by Detroit. Let's hope the 2006 Series is as memorable and as competitive as the 1968 Series was. Well, it's certainly tried because in the first inning of the opening game, baseball history was made. It's Anthony Reyes making the start, the rookie, and this is the first time in World Series history that two rookies will hook up in game number one. It wasn't the smoothest of starts for either rookie, as they were both nicked early on. And it is long gone, and that'll tie the game. A home run by Roland ties it. St. Louis one, Detroit one. But Anthony Reyes, whose five regular season wins were the fewest ever for a World Series game one starter, recovered to pitch a game he'll never forget. As a young kid that doesn't have very many starts in the big leagues to do that in such a huge stage was amazing. Anthony Reyes with the game of his life. I'm just going to take it as a win in the World Series and try to think about it, uh, you know what I've done when this whole thing's over with. But right now we got the series one. In game two, the spotlight shined on Tiger lefty Kenny Rogers, who entered the night with 15 straight scoreless postseason innings to his credit. Fastball swung on and missed. He struck him out. Kenny Rogers, seven shutout innings. Rogers extended that streak to 23 scoreless frames and helped the Tigers even the series at a game apiece. And we are moments away from getting started. In a red sea here in St. Louis this evening. Got the adrenaline ball for the World Series. St. Louis sent the 2005 Cy Young Award winner to the mound. And Chris Carpenter was sensational. Carpenter, eight innings, no runs, three hits, no walks, six strikeouts. The Cardinals went up three games to one when David Eckstein delivered in game four. The swing, and there's a ball hit to left center. Eckstein has an RBI double. St. Louis fans had every reason to believe their Redbirds would clinch the series at home in game five. Big, big crowd, and they are all jittered up here tonight. They want to see a world championship flag fly over downtown St. Louis. The pressure was on Cardinals starter Jeff Weaver, but he found a way to stay in the moment. I wanted to make sure to slow things down, try to trick myself into acting like it was a normal, everyday game. Swing and a miss. He threw a four-seamer right by him. Weaver's pitch. Swing and a miss. Jeff Weaver is pitching the game of his life. And thanks to Jeff, the Cardinals did indeed weave another championship into their tapestry of titles. Swing and a miss! The Cardinals are world champions for 2006! Just a surreal situation. Just turning and seeing the joy on everyone's face was unbelievable. The 2007 Colorado Rockies made an incredible run to win the wild card. The throw to the plate, he is safe! By the time they reached the World Series, the relentless Rockies had won 21 of their past 22. Tulowitzki has it, throws the first, ball game! World Series time in Colorado! But first, they had to head to Boston, where they'd meet the powerful Red Sox. Game one of the 103rd World Series. You've got the Boston Red Sox, the fabled Red Sox. They're playing a team in the World Series tonight that didn't exist until 1993. Good luck to you, Bobby. Hey, congratulations to you guys, man. Oh, thank you. But as hot as the Rockies were, they were on the road at Fenway, and they had to face Josh Beckett. You're facing a team that had won 21 out of 22, hadn't lost the game in 38 days. Josh set the tone, and he set the tone right from the get-go. Yeah. Fastball on the outside corner, strike three, call. That'll do it for the Rockies. They're out in order, and Beckett fans the side. Beckett did his part, and the Boston offense erupted, giving the Red Sox a smooth and forceful game one victory. Tonight at Fenway, all Boston. The Red Sox 13, the Rockies 1. Boston also got a tight win in Game 2 with Kurt Schilling adding to his impressive resume by winning his 11th career postseason game. That put the Sox up 
two games to none. The legend grows for Kurt Schilling. For the first time ever, a World Series game would be played in Colorado. And despite being down, Rockies fans were ready to rock. It's be somewhat loud tonight, huh? Yeah, it's going to be great. It'll be fun. What a charged up atmosphere here in Denver as the city and his ballpark prepares to host its first ever World Series game. But Daisuke Matsuzaka cut through the noise to become the first Japanese born pitcher ever to both start and win a World Series game. Breaking ball for strike three. The Boston Red Sox are one game away from winning the World Championship. It is game four of the World Series from Coors Field in Denver. Stingy starting pitching had become the theme for Boston, and game four would top them all. Red Sox lefty John Lester had overcome cancer and was now in line to pitch the series clinching game. And did he ever rise to the occasion? Swing and a miss at a high fastball, he got him. In a truly inspirational performance, Lester threw five and two thirds shutout innings. You know, we tried to downplay his situation because we were competing. He came out and competed. He didn't get tired. He kept his stamina. Uh, he threw strikes. He, he, did a, he did a great job. We were proud of him. And though a late surge by the Rockies brought them back to within one, closer Jonathan Papelbon put an end to their magical run. The 2-2 pitch. Game over, series over, and the Red Sox are world champs again. It's over. The Red Sox have swept the Colorado Rockies. And the world championship of Major League Baseball once again belongs to Red Sox Nation. Under the cover of a dome in Florida, any hopes the Red Sox might have had about repeating in 08 were shot down by an 11 year old expansion team on the verge of capturing its first pennant. The Rays are going to the World Series! This improbable season has another chapter to it! Their opponent was the Phillies, back in the Fall Classic for the first time since 1993, and looking for just their second ever World Series title. The more seasoned team made an early statement in game one, thanks to second baseman Chase Utley. There's a drive deep to right field going back to Obris at the warning track. At the wall, two run home run, Chase Utley here on the top of the first. And the Phillies strike first in St. Pete with a 2 nothing lead, three batters into the ball game. You always want to try to score early, especially on the road, to get an early lead, especially for Cole Hamels. Uh, you can't ask for something better. Hamels would win his fourth straight postseason start in 08. With a little help from closer Brad Lidge, who was fresh off a regular season that saw him save 41 games in 41 chances. Lidge with a 1-2-3 ninth inning, and the Phillies have game one. The Rays rebounded to win the next one, and even the series at a game apiece. But when the two teams returned to Philadelphia for game three, the fickle fall weather became the series story. Right now, the rain continues to fall. The tarp is down, and we will be in a delay for the start of this one. This is October weather right here. After more than an hour and a half, the game finally got underway, and some three hours after that, Carlos Ruiz ended it with a squibber of a hit. High fastball, chop slowly toward third. It's rolling. Handed by Longoria, an underhanded throw, tails over the head of the catcher, and the ball game is over. Oh! Oh! Two nights later, the rain was back, with the Phillies now just one win away from the title. This time, baseball tried to weather the storm. It can't get much worse than this, no. and have them continue to play baseball. No. It is an official game, however. But following the top of the sixth, with the game now tied at two, the rain became too much for the teams to continue. Tonight's game has been suspended. It will be resumed when I believe that weather conditions are appropriate. That time came two days later, 
when the first ever suspension of a World Series game was lifted, resulting in a very unusual sight as game five between the Phillies and the Rays resumed. The fact that we're starting the bottom of the sixth inning, it's the home team that gets to hit first. Worth the shallow fly ball. Ewan Murray can't make the play. And the Phillies take the lead. Baldelli hits one into left. Rocco Baldelli has gone deep. It's 3-3 in the top of the seventh. And a ground ball up the middle. Base hit. Pedro Feliz delivers. 4-3 Philadelphia. Fans in the city of brotherly love had waited a long time for this moment. And Lidge came on to seal it. The 0-2 pitch. The 09 series began in New York, with the visiting Phillies hoping to repeat. But they'd be facing a 103 win Yankee team, one that was in the Fall Classic for the first time in six years. It's going to be tough. I mean, for us to be the champions, we have to uh, beat the champions. And I think that's what everybody in baseball wanted to see. You know, he's not playing the National League this week. He's playing the varsity. <laughs> <laughs> the Phils were loose, and Utley once again gave them a game one boost. Into the bleachers! It's the second home run of the night for Chase Utley. Thanks in large part to Utley's power stroke and a masterful performance by Cliff Lee. The Phillies were now a step closer to becoming the first back-to-back -back champions since the Yankees did it at the turn of the century. The Phillies take game one. Unfortunately for the Phils, Hideki Matsui was ready to explode, and he took Pedro Martinez deep to help the Yankees to a game two win. When the series shifted to Philadelphia, the home team took a 3-0 lead early. But then, Alex Rodriguez found a camera angle he liked. Here's one down the right field line. And gave the game a whole new focus. It's high off the wall, a fair ball. Looked like it actually hit a camera above the right field wall and should be called a home run. It is a home run. Thanks to the first ever World Series home run confirmed by replay and more power from Matsui, the Yankees now appeared to have the momentum. But the Yankees have now taken a two games to one lead in the World Series. A night later, the third homer of the series by Chase Utley, all of them off CC Sabathia, got the Phillies to within one. Chase Utley has taken CC deep again. But in the ninth, Johnny Damon stole two bags and the show. And Damon now runs towards third and there's no one there because of the overship. Damon opened the door for the Yankees who scored three times in the inning and won their second straight in Philadelphia. And they can wrap it up tomorrow night. Do it, all right, all right. The Phils were now desperate for a win and they got it with a formula similar to game one. Shot into right. He has done it again. Chase Utley with his second multi homer game in this World Series. Utley's fifth home run tied the World Series record. And Cliff Lee got through seven. Strike three called. The Phillies won eight to six. And so the series returned to the Bronx with the Yankees leading three games to two. 27 outs for their 27th championship. And World Series MVP Hideki Matsui played the numbers game to perfection by rolling a six. And Matsui-san has six RBIs. By tying the record for most RBIs in a single World Series game, Matsui had done his part to lead the Yankees to that magical number of 27. The Yankees are back on top. World champions for the 27th time. Although Cliff Lee had failed to earn a ring with the Phillies in 09, he got another chance the following year when his new team, the Texas Rangers, faced off in their first ever World Series 
against the upstart San Francisco Giants. With Game 1 of the World Series, you expect a good matchup, but this one is over the top. It was, after all, a battle of former Cy Young Award winners, but it was the hitters who took control. And the first run of this World Series belongs to Texas. So the Rangers definitely making Lincecum work here in the first inning. To come out and blow out Cliff Lee, uh, the most dominant pitcher uh, in the postseason. And that's it for Lee. There was almost a sense of not believing. San Francisco churned out one hit after another. High fly ball to left. Uribe shoots one. They went on to score a nearly astonishing 11 runs in the victory. Giants win game one. In game two, righty Matt Kane and lefty C.J. Wilson produced the pitcher's duel that most fans had expected in the opener. And a swing and a miss, first strikeout for Matt Kane. And the pitch, struck him out looking. But a blister sent Wilson to the showers after six-plus innings, and the Giants blitzed the Rangers' bullpen and won nine to nothing. The series moved to Texas for the next three, and it was a brand new venue for the Fall Classic. The first World Series game ever played here at Rangers Ballpark in Arlington. And it was a rookie, Mitch Moreland, who provided the big hit in the Rangers 4-2 win. Deep drive to right. That ball is way, way back. That ball is history. It's a three-run Jimmy Jack for Mitch Moreland. And it was still another rookie who stole the spotlight the following night. Giants starter Madison Bumgarner threw eight shutout innings, and that put the Giants one win away from their first championship since 1954. An unforgettable performance by a 21-year-old. Game five featured a rematch of Lincecum and Lee, and this time, the two aces were both dealing. The result was a tense fall classic contest. Cliff Lee with a strong first inning. Swing and a miss. Lincecum is absolutely dominating. Come the seventh, series MVP Edgar Renteria would give the Giants all the offense they'd need. Yeah! Edgar Renteria has hit a three-run homer. He's going to eat one. He's going. And as he had done so often that year, Brian Wilson shut the door. The Giants are world champions. The Rangers returned to the World Series in 2011, and this time, they were up against a sizzling hot St. Louis Cardinal team. One that had gone on a miracle run in September to just barely reach postseason play. That attitude that the boys had developed about heck or high water, they're gonna play nine, that's the best example. And in game one, the Cardinals took a 3-2 lead on Alan Craig's pinch hit single. Slash to the right field side and a sliding attempt by Cruz, but he can't make the catch. One run is home. The St. Louis bullpen also came up big, securing a game one triumph for the Cardinals. Bullpen going three shutout and he's giving up just one hit. But that bullpen blew the lead the following night, allowing Texas to tie the series at a game apiece. And the Rangers win game two. With the series back in Texas for the second straight year, fans thought the bats might heat up. But nobody could have predicted the historic performance about to be put on by one man in particular. A high fastball hit a mile way back into the bleachers and gone. Just tied the all-time World Series single game home run record, hits record, and RBI record. Albert's 14 total bases were a series record and helped the Cardinals take game three. Down two games to one, the Rangers looked to get even. A dominant Derek Holland turned the trick. 95, that's as hard as Holland has been throwing since the beginning. Holland's eight-plus innings of brilliant shutout ball enabled Texas to tie the series at two games each. Derek Holland walks off the field for the moment he'll never forget. 
The following night, Texas catcher Mike Napoli delivered a clutch two-run double in the eighth. And that put the Rangers ahead to stay. Texas has won four to two, and they lead three to two in the World Series. Texas appeared to be in command. If Texas wins tonight, the Texas Ranger franchise will have its first ever World Series championship. But down by two and one strike from elimination, the Cardinals showed their resolve once again, with a moment forever frozen in time. The one, two, and a fastball hit to right field. Going back is Cruz, and that's it! Who scores? Berkman scores! Freeze in the third, it's time! A Josh Hamilton two-run homer in the 10th once again gave Texas the lead. And it's 9-7 Texas here in the 10th. But in the bottom half of the inning, once again, the Cardinals battled back. And once again, they were down to their last strike. In the air to center. Way back. It is gone. We will see you tomorrow night. But Freeze wasn't done as he put the Cardinals on the board in Game 7. Swing and a shot to left center. Bohol scores. Berkman scores. This game is tied up. And Alan Craig's homer in the third gave the Cardinals a lead they weren't about to relinquish. Ball game. World champion St. Louis Cardinals. What a team. I'm Bob Costas. Thanks for watching the World Series, History of the Fall Classic. We leave you now with more than a century's worth of champions.